Good morning, everybody. I uh, hope everybody's got on their second cup of coffee like me. Uh, my name is Tom Suter. I am the founder and CEO of the Advanced Technology Academic Research Center, or more affectionately known as ATARC. Uh, today, we're going to be talking uh, about identity management, and it, it, in the title, we're talking mission critical. Identity management is mission critical. And so, uh, really excited about the day you're, this morning that you're going to have. Uh, I want to thank our partners at Beyond Trust at SailPoint. They kind of helped us create this summit. They've been very good, uh, faithful partners of ATARC. And I would like to thank you for joining us today. And uh, I'd like to thank all of our panelists. So here's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to, uh, there's going to be time for Q&A, a little bit of time in each of these panels. We're also going to uh, put in some uh, polls and uh, get, you interactive, get you interactive. And there's another reason to do that. And I always get in trouble if I don't do it. So I, I try to keep on the good side of these CP credit people, but you will get CP credits, uh, which is very important to many of you in your continuous education. Uh, so up first, we got a treat for you. Um, a man has been in the news quite a bit lately, um, our good friend, Jerry Karen. And Jerry is the Chief Information Officer, Assistant Inspector General for Information Technology within the Office of the Inspector General, OIG, that is uh, in the Department of Health and Human Services. Jerry Karen, can we pull you up? Jerry, there we go. There yep, good morning. There we go. Hey, good morning. good morning, Jerry. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Thanks for having good, me. Good. Yep, yep. It looks like you're in your office today, huh? Yes. Good. Yep, good. Did the commute. Okay. Well, thanks for coming. I look forward to your comments. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and, and welcome everyone. Happy to be here as always. Um, do a lot of work with ATARC. Um, if you don't know, I have been the chair for the TIC 3.0 working group at ATARC, as well as I am one of the chairs for the Zero Trust working group as well, um, which I'll talk a little bit about here in a, in a bit. Uh, but first, uh, we're here to talk about identity. Identity is very important, uh, especially with uh, the executive you know, with Zero Trust, you have the Executive Order 14028, improving the nation's cybersecurity, and then just uh, recently, OMB Memorandum M2209, moving the U.S. government towards Zero Trust cybersecurity principles. Why that's important? Because there's a big emphasis, especially in the memo, you will see uh, on identity and authentication and things like that. So very important, and identity is a main pillar, one of the main pillars of zero trust as we move towards the zero trust. And there's lots of parts to identity. So, you know, um, in the old days, of course, um, you know, we'd have general user accounts. Some of us were administrators. We'd have administrator accounts, um, applications. They would have identity stores, so you'd have a, um, accounts for that. And then as we move to the cloud, of course, there's digital identities there. So there you have a plur you have a proliferation of digital identities, but you're only one human being. So it's very important to tie those digital identities back to you as the one human being. When we talk about zero trust, it's about when I talk to my user base, why is zero trust important to them? It's because we want to get the right information to the right people at the right time. And we want to make sure that that data is reliable and has its integrity so that they can rely upon it. But notice I say the right information to the right people at the right time. So we want to be judicious about it. Not all the information to all the people all the time. Uh, we have different levels. Not all data is created equal. We have different levels of data. So we want to make sure that the right people have it at the right time. So not they don't always have it. Um, things like uh, system administrators, we want to make sure we time bound them. Uh, historically, sometimes we'd add them to a group. And by the results of being part of that group, they would perpetually be administrators and have those escalated privileges, even when not in use. So doing things like vaulting them, taking away their privileges. Uh, very important when we talk about provisioning and deprovisioning, birthright access. You know, if the result of you being in job A, you get these rights. If you move to job B, well, you don't need job A's rights anymore because of that life event of moving jobs. So we want to make sure we have rate governances in place. So identity has a lot of aspects when you look at it, uh, a lot of details that need to be 
uh, addressed, especially in a zero trust. Ongoing authorization, ongoing access, not one time, not a one time linear event. We want to keep revisiting is the right. Are you supposed to be here? Are you not? I like to use the example of a movie theater. You go into the movie theater. Most people are allowed in the lobby, but usually the movie theater I go to, they check the tickets in the lobby. We want to move the ticket takers to the doors of the day, of the movie theaters in the multiplex because not everybody has access, depending on the ticket, to every movie. They have access to one movie, that movie being the data. So we put the ticket takers at the door, and we want the ushers to constantly come in. Are people in the right seat? Are all the factors correct? Is this person supposed to be in here? They have the right ticket. They have the right seat. So we want to make sure that they have the right authentication, the right access, and constantly check that. Can't be a one-time event because why? Factors can change. And if those factors change, a risk threshold may be triggered, whereas we need to take some sort of action. So very important to be very dynamic. So as I mentioned, identity, uh, you'll go um, and talk a lot about identity today. It's very important. It's not all of zero trust, remember, um, but it is a very huge focal point for a lot of people. Uh, so before I go though, I do want to mention uh, what we are doing in ATARC with the Zero Trust Lab. Uh, we've had this working group for well over a year now. I'm proud to say we have about 54 vendors participating and presenting their solutions is in regards to Zero Trust. Not all are our identity solutions. Uh, they cover different aspects of Zero Trust, but there are many that do provide identity solutions. Out of the whole 54, they tell us what functional capabilities that they cover in our zero trust capabilities model. And each one, every Friday at 11 a.m., we have one to two presentations of vendors who have 75 minutes each based on an outline provided with use cases covering, telling us about their functional capabilities, going through those use cases and demoing those to the audience. They are also recorded and put uh, and, and put on ATARC's YouTube site. If you subscribe to that, you can see the past ones you may have missed. So every Friday at 11, uh, there will be a presentation. I believe Beyond Trust, who's one of the sponsors, I think that Tom mentioned today, is this Friday at 11. So uh, definitely go to ATARC.org uh, and you can uh, see how to sign up for that and learn more. And Tom, I think what I'll do is I'll pass it back over to you unless there's any questions. Okay. Yeah, I've got a couple questions. Um, I'm, I got to buy a little time. Well, Jason's probably breaking a story somewhere. We don't quite have him on yet, so <laughs> um, yeah, I'm sure I'm yes. sure we'll get him in a minute. But it, yeah, so what are we? I know uh, we've had a couple discussions about the future of the lab. I know that the lab's kind yes. of open. I know we were talking before about working directly with agencies and and helping them. If you want to go color that. It, add a little color to what we've been talking about for the future. Yeah, so um, going back to our TIC 3.0 lab, of course, we had a, a bunch of demos built in that, but of course, uh, we had to take them down. But uh, we're looking for more permanent lab uh, to be stood up so that we can advance and keep building on some of these things, as well as some of the other working groups in ATARC. We can kind of start tying them together rather than having a stovepipe zero trust lab and a cloud lab sitting over here. Um, if there is one, we can kind of bring it all together and show how it actually would look in an actual environment. Um, so that's kind of the hope. So setting up something a little more permanent is uh, what we're talking about and trying to, um, in the early throes of discussing how to go about approaching that. Uh, we have, you know, people setting up labs right now, but we don't want to just be tear down and go away because we can always build um, as the technology gets better. And we can show a lot of different integrations as well, because that's the good thing about Zero Trust is that it's an integration effort, right? I'm gonna take some of my investments that I already have and um, maybe bring in some new tools as gap fillers, and I gotta be able to integrate those. So we might, we'll even be able to show different types of integrations in, in a more permanent lab as well. Great, great. Well, thank you for that, uh, Jerry. I appreciate it. And yeah. uh, Jason is with us. He. Uh, he he's we got to change his name or something. There is Jason Miller. He he turned into Sean Connolly. You don't look like Sean Connolly. We'll we'll change that. I can't hear you, Jason. Okay. 
That Thank is weird. I, I, I shouldn't be Sean Connolly. I don't even look like Sean Connolly. No, no, no. Um, how are you doing? Are you breaking any stories this week? You want to give us a little scoop of what you're working on or not? Uh, nothing, you know, after yesterday's big news, you know, of uh, SBA CIO taking a leave of absence, that was the big story of yesterday, maybe a little uh, return to work uh, memo that uh, got put out there by an agency yet to be to, talked about that maybe we'll have something on that later today. And, and, uh, you know, I'll just I'll self plug Tom, since you gave me the opportunity, I uh, we're talking about uh, zero trust, we're talking about identity and access management, my ask the CIO this week, Chris Russia, the federal CISO, we talk a lot about zero trust. So I'll, I'll give a shameless plug, Tom. I saw that. I think we put it in our newsletter. I thought it would be fantastic. Uh, well, anyway, I think you got an extra five minutes out of this, too. So I know you'll use it. So you got, you got an extra five Absolutely. minutes now. Okay. Absolutely. Well, I'll sign off. Thank you, Jason, for doing this. All right. My pleasure. Uh, and of course, uh, thanks to Tom and, and to all the folks at ATAR, Alyssa Cole, who invited me to do this. I, I love these panels. Uh, Tom knows uh, I would just want them to be longer. So I'll make sure Tom knows that that uh, 30 minutes is never enough time when, when he puts together a, a great panel of folks to join us. So uh, if, if, if uh, the folks want to turn on their cameras, Sean and Josh and Ida and Ken, we can get started. Uh, as you heard, I'm Jason Miller, executive editor of Federal News Network. Uh, again, shameless plug number two of the day, 1500 AM. You can find us in the DC area. And of course, federalnewsnetwork.com. You can find us around the world. So for our panel today, I've asked the panelists to take about two to four minutes to tell you something you don't know about their efforts around the integration of zero trust and identity and access management. And then we'll get to audience questions. Again, please participate. I'm a reporter. I can ask questions all day. It's my job to do that. I think the panelists would much rather hear from all of you. So that being said, let me just set a little bit of context. I thought uh, Jerry Karen did a great job of really kind of explaining where zero trust and, and identity management fits together. And, and tomorrow actually marks the one week anniversary, if we celebrate those types of anniversaries, since uh, OMB released that final zero trust strategy. So Tom, congratulations. ATRAX timing couldn't be more perfect for this conversation. Uh, now, if you haven't read the strategy yet, and, and I'll make an assumption that most of you have, but identity and access management is definitely front and center. And in fact, Federal Assistant Chris Russia told me in an interview that while every agency is at a different starting point on the zero trust journey and will achieve strategies, objectives at different times than, than, you know, across the different areas, identity and multi-factor authentication are among the most important areas that OMB will emphasize, encourage, and I'll even use the word mandate first and foremost. Now, this focus on identity isn't new. If you remember HSPD 12, 2005, or if you're old like I am from the late 1990s when DOD began to roll out the common access card. Those were those initial attempts to get those federal arms around identity and access management. But as we've seen over the last couple of years, cloud, mobile devices, and of course the proficiency of cyber attackers, identity isn't just the new perimeter, it's really the best defense to stop, to limit, and be resilient to the ever-changing nature of cyber attacks. So with that being said, let's turn to our panelists and, and, and get a better understanding of of what they're doing and how they're gonna help you and help me understand where this integration happens. So uh, uh, we're unrehearsed, we're unplanned. So uh, Ken, I'll start with you since you're the first one on my list. Uh, Ken's over at GSA. Uh, Ken, you wanna start us off? Tell us something we don't know about identity and access management. Can can you're muted for some reason? Try to unmute yourself. Yeah, no, sorry about there you that. Go. We did it. <laughs> there we go. All right, all right. Thanks, Jason. Yeah, I would say you know one one interesting thing about zero trust that that maybe many not think about, and maybe it's a maturity step, is that you know uh, we think about a, a person trying to access something, right? That's that's what we're trying to to wrap our brain around. But I would say you know something that we're looking at is what what about the things? What are, what about the underlying? You know what's happening? Servers talking to each other, devices talking to each other. Um, you know, your service principles, your, your scripts, what are, what's the protection around those? And like I said, that's a maturity step, but it's also something to think about, you know, once you have your hands wrapped around the person side of it, you can, then you have to talk, think about the, uh, the non-person side. So I'll throw that out. All right. When we talk about the non-person side, I mean, a lot of people are going to automatically go, Ken, to robotics process automation, robots. And then that has been an issue that has come up over the years, last couple of years. But you're also talking about more than that. You're talking about IoT devices, I imagine, and, and what else? 
Yeah, yeah. So yeah, if we look at the NIST term for non-persons entity, NPE, right? It's any any non-person in, in cyberspace. And actually, so we have we have two playbooks that talk about it, five cam playbooks that are available at playbooks.idmanagement.gov. And we classify MPE in two different areas. We have a digital worker, which is your RPA, your script. <clears throat> um, it's kind of like a software-based identity. Um, and so the playbook we have there is called the Digital Worker Identity Playbook. It was an internal collaboration with the RPA community of practice. And it's really kind of a risk assessment to understand what, what these uh, digital workers are doing and then how to credential them. Uh, the other side of it, which is kind of a gap right, we have right now, but it's identified from a playbook perspective, it's a gap. We don't really have guidance on it, is the machine identity part of it. So your server to server communication, your IoT, like you mentioned, your other, you know, we, we vaguely classify it as, you know, hardware based things, um, pretty much. All right, and I imagine those playbooks, I can find them, you can find them, I anyone think, can I find think them. You I might, think you might be being now, Jason. <laughs> we lost you, your Ken. turn. Ken, we lost you. Did you hear me on that? Yeah, we, no? we can hear you, Jason. Hmm. Jason. Jason, I can hear you. you. Still can't hear me, right? Yeah, we can, we can see your mouth moving. I don't know what's... Unmute. All right. Can you hear me, Sean? Sean says yes. All right. Ken, I don't know what happened. We'll call it the uh, we'll call it the the, the wizards. Uh, those playbooks are available for anybody, correct? Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Just go to playbooks.idmanagement.gov and they're right there. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Uh, Sean, uh, why don't you uh, build up on that from CISA's perspective? Uh, Sean, always great to catch up with you. Uh, take it away. Hey, Jason, just sound check. Can you give me a nod? Can you hear me? Okay, it's going to be a 30-page Zero Trust memo, and he's saying, what's next? What's coming out there? We've been working on this memo for a long time. Uh, like you mentioned, Krista Russia, Claire Matarona, Maria Road, of course. The, the leadership over OMB has very much been focused on how do we have Zero Trust move the federal enterprise for and so that that memo that was released last week jerry just talked about it a lot also and first and foremost identity right in there i think uh, it's a 30 page memo i think identity's mentioned almost 30 times in it so there's a large strong focus from leadership toward identity um and i think it's really identity is going to become the coin of the realm in some ways in terms of how it connects everything together how the how the users are being able to talk to everyone. You know, Ken just talked about some things besides just the users themselves. I think another thing to be aware of is how we are going to become an API economy in terms of how APIs are going to be connecting everything together. And again, that's a different abstract way of looking at identity. So there's a number of ways that you can look at identity. Know thyself, right? Going back to Socrates and Oracle Delphi. It's, all, it's been around for a long time. Nothing new. Um, so as we focus on identity, Again, that I think that second and third page of the memo itself, it talks about the first thing, uh, building out enterprise accounts. It had some very tactical uh, uh, taskers in the memo uh, with the enterprise accounts, make them so they're efficient resistant. That's very tactical, but it's very uh, much applicable to what we're trying to do to secure the attack service right now. So there's a number of ways we go more into these as we go on, but there's a number of ways I think the federal government is starting to come out with these new directives and push everyone forward. Thank you. So I want to be clear on something for Sean because uh, I was not asking for more from you. You you've been very busy. I I will fully accept that over the last few months. But um, uh, let me let me go back to the one thing you said because I think this is interesting. The API connected to everything. When you read through uh, the memo and, and and the the focus on identity, this one one of the comments that I heard from folks in industry is they've really moved down to the application layer. The, the, they're really saying protect the application, not the network per se. And, and that was a big change in the strategy. Is that where that API connection, is that, is that the why you think this is the next evolution when it comes to identity and access management because everything is at the application layer? Sure, it's very good, Jason. Yeah, it's at the application layer. 
And it's also the connecting of the applications together, right? The back end system, the mid systems, the, the front uh, door system. So it's, it's really a connection of all that together. APIs, cross your fingers using open standards are gonna be what's connecting everything. So I think it's very critical. Uh, I forget which one of like Gartner Forrester came out said API is going to become one of the new attack vectors for uh, the adversaries to look at. So we've got to be cognizant of what is, you know, that, that inventory itself, like going back to Ken, it's not only just the users, it's the systems themselves. And it's also the transactions that are going across those uh, networks. All right. Hopefully a lot more now to talk to you. Now you brought up APIs as a new attack vector, something else for us to worry about. Uh, Ida, let's uh, bring in maybe the agency focus from, from your perspective, Bureau of Industry and Security. Um, for us, we've been a, a little, a sort of ahead of the curve a little bit with the on-prem. So we have on-prem and um, cloud systems. Uh, on-prem systems were built with the compartmentalized architecture. So basically no network component trusted the other network component. And um, so that was verification. One of the problems that I should say challenges we're facing now as we move to the cloud is trying to make sure we maintain that at the network level. And like Sean said, now we got to move to the application level. So um, from a practicality standpoint, uh, even though we're looking at APIs and the data, making sure data flows, we still have to make sure that no network component is being, uh, let's say, trusted or assume that everything is correct. So what we've did is um, we went back and uh, we're going back now and doing a uh, data flow and looking at all the components that we never considered before. Again, like the um, uh, automatic workflows we have, uh, that data transfers. So we have to look at those as attack vectors in the network where we had never did really consider that before. Thanks, Ida. Let's, let's, the follow-up I have is, let's put a, maybe a little finer point on that because when you're saying you're looking at the data flows and network components, we're talking about router switches, um, everything, yeah, everything. And, and, and the concern is that, okay, if your router talks to your application layer to let a, somebody in, is that data flow that's happening? Is that secured in some way? Help me understand that a little bit. Cause I'm, I'm not a techie. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So what we're looking at is just because a connection can be made, um, from the router to the server. Uh, now we have to look at the individual uh, who's getting the access. So what we have is um, individuals who have the roles and let's say you're at this role and you can get access to this data. And, but there are certain things because we work on cases that this person may not necessarily need access to this case. So one of the things we're also looking at is how can we expand or include with our RBAC access, also ABAC access. So if certain cases, just because you're an investigator, you can't look at certain things. And so we're trying to tie all of that together to make a complete solution. All right, plenty more questions around that, but let's turn to Josh from Beyond Trust. Josh, maybe, I don't know if you wanna to react to what, what you've heard or just give us kind of what you're seeing among your federal clients. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll do a, a little bit of all of that. Um, so I'm Josh Broadbent. I am the um, RVP of Solutions Engineering for Beyond Trust Software. Um, <clears throat> so definitely this conversation around non-human identities is a conversation that we at BT have been having for a while and how we access those, how we take care of those. Yes, um, RPA becomes a conversation in that, but not just RPA, but, you know, service accounts and application to application accounts. Um, we also, as we are looking at privilege, um, we're looking at applications, but not necessarily thinking application layer. We're thinking things like we don't want users to be able to have privilege to elevate applications. We actually want the application to elevate without the users having privilege. And I realize that sounds like this weird riddle distinction, but it's not. Um, we can do that uh, in, in a few different ways that we can, we can get into later. Um, one thing that we are seeing, of course, uh, across our federal customers is this concept of being able to make sure that you have um, identity verification cross domain, right? So the concept of being able to interact with other agencies or other pieces of data, 
while um, while still maintaining the I identity security that you're trying to implement. Um, it was mentioned a little bit in the OMB memo that came out last week as far as that cross-domain functionality, which by the way, goes really well with like a mid-bodied red. If you guys haven't read the memo yet, I, I highly recommend, you know, uh, might take a whole bottle. Um, but anyways, um, we, uh, you know, we've, we've been looking at that a lot. We've been having that conversation a lot with both our federal and DOD customers around how we can um, have those conversations, how agencies can interact with each other while still maintaining data integrity, identity integrity. Um, so yeah, the, the things that we've heard from, from our government partners uh, so far have been right on point with, with where we've been with our federal customers. I want to remind the folks to kind of go ahead and send in your questions. I think we have one so far, so please send them in. But Josh, quick follow-up for you before we get to uh, audience questions and, and continue our conversation more broadly. Uh, I, I love this idea of elevate the application uh, to meet where the users are versus the users elevating the app, uh, application without getting too technical. What you're saying is based on roles, responsibilities, the application knows that Josh should have access to the application versus Josh saying, oh, I should have access to that application because of my privilege. Uh, uh, maybe I'm not 100% there, but- how No, no, I mean, that's, that's um, very close, honestly. Uh, it's the concept of the system knowing Josh is supposed to have access to this application and because he's supposed to have access to this application and this application needs a specific set of rights to run, we are going to grant that application these specific sets of rights, uh, the specific sets of rights to run instead of- granting the user so that that user can't be leveraged or used later in some form of lateral movement. And really, I mean, what we're talking about now, and, and let's maybe bring in the entire panel here as we get to questions, uh, really what we're talking about here in, in so many regards is that is that understanding of who the user is and why they are able to access an application, a database, or whatever it is. Uh, I'll just kind of open it up to the panelists. The whole point of, of this focus on identity management is really to limit the cyber attacker's success, because that's what that's what we're, I mean, in the end, that's what we're trying to get to in some regards. I, I don't know. I'll just, I know maybe there's not a question per se in there, but why that's the focus on the application layer. That's the focus on the identity piece. I, I know Sean or, or Ken or Ida, someone wants to jump in. Yeah, I'll, I'll just start. You hit on the key word there, Jason, right? Before, for a long time, it was who was talking, what was talking, but now it's why. Why Why are you accessing? And that why, you need know, a lot more context around it, different context. And that's that's where I think you see a lot of the vendors, you see the community moving towards is understanding that greater contextual story of that access. So it is, it is going to be a, a shift from where we were you want like 10, 15 years ago, and Ida was talking about more, uh, I think where we were 10 years ago with network access control and how we moved it forward around role-based access controls. There are these all these questions that now open up as we try to answer that why. Thank you. Another thing we're looking at is where, uh, just because a user has access, let's say in the United States, if they travel, we are probably not gonna give them the full access if they're going to different countries. So we're now we're looking at geolocation, figuring that into at levels of access. So we want the user to be able to have an access. If you're in, let's say you're in the United States, you have a certain level of access, you can see certain things. You go to certain countries, well, that's going to be degraded. So then when you come back into the United States, you can get your same level of access back without us having to do anything from the system. So one of the contexts we're looking at is where you're accessing the data and the applications from. And Ida, real quick on a quick follow-up on that, would it be something where, and I know every country is different, every person is different, but potentially something where I can read something, but I can't write against it, meaning I, maybe I could see it, but I can't really download it. I can't do anything but see it versus I can't even see it because if you're in a country that maybe is more hostile, uh, you know, the China, the Iran, the Russia, then maybe you, you will have no access to this specific database at all. Is that, is that the type of thing? Exactly. Think yeah, yes, exactly. Based on certain countries, you may get certain levels of access. And then based on you know certain countries at certain points in time, you may not can see anything. I'll add, I'll add one thing on there. I think that 
I mean, for the for those have have been around the federal ICAM community, you know, a lot of, a lot of people remember the ICAM roadmap, which is still a document today. But I think one advantage that we have today is that it seems like technology, especially cloud adoption, has really picked up, and a lot of the identity uh, systems that we have today have a lot of these features built in where before they may have not. So it's definitely an advantage uh, for organizations today to be able to implement some like a lot of the zero trust principles. Exactly, so it's a lot easier for us now with going to the cloud and having that geo um, support there available. So now we can automatically program that stuff in. Whereas in the past, we may not have known or you have to tell us where you're going or if some user gets you know, some reason they have to go to another country that we were expecting them to go to. And now they've gone to another country that we weren't expecting. So now we can automatically have that support built in for the user. All right, we got a couple of questions from the audience. So let's, uh, let's get started. Uh, the first one uh, talks about non-person identities are crucial for ZT. However, system programs like CDM don't address them. Are there alternative programs to support this? Sean, I guess that's, uh, even though you're not a CDM expert, this is, uh, you're, you're from CISA, so we'll start with you. Sure, no, that's a, that's a great question. There's certainly interest, um, to be fair. Uh, when CDM was really started under John Stroyford and some others at CISA, I was part of the group that brought over from State Department. I've been associated with the CDM program since the beginning. Uh, but the, the questionnaire is right in terms of we've been focused on the identity side, the user side of it. Uh, in the memo, there is a strong hook towards CDM. I think it's one of the programs that's most called out uh, to support zero trust. And so, yes, there needs to be and there will be a stronger focus towards understanding that greater inventory of uh, resources, not only the users themselves, but again, going back to the assets, the programs that are right on their applications, I mean. So yeah, there is a strong interest across the community for the CDM to move towards uh, the greater landscape. All right, Josh, we got one for you. I think uh, one of your colleagues may have sent this in, maybe not, I don't know. But uh, Chandra says, uh, how, how can the zero trust how can zero trust be achieved with beyond trust and sale point identity for privilege access account based on the type of user having different levels of privilege? Can someone show some light, shed some light probably? Is that, is that one of your colleagues uh, giving you a softball there? Um, actually, so, I mean, if, if it is, I don't, I don't recognize them. I'll say that. Um, so I appreciate the question though, because it is kind of a, a softball for me. Um, you know, one of the things I've done a lot of these panels over the past 18, 24 months with uh, even a lot of the people that are, are here today. Um, and somewhere along the way, we end up with the conversation of zero trust isn't a product. It's, it's an architecture. It's a mindset, right? Um, so even with sale point and beyond trust, those are things that integrate well together. We uh, talking about open integration standards, open APIs. We use the skim connector with uh, sale point so that we can, um, fully leverage a lot of their identity management solution and practice. Um, for us, that zero trust continues with SailPoint because we continue that story of just-in-time access for privileged users, right? We can decide which users in which roles have specific privileged access to which assets. Um, and again, that's something that's going to constantly get re-verified. We're going to do um, attestation with SailPoint. Um, we're going to leverage SailPoint's directory. Um, they're going to make direct calls to us. Um, so for all of those things, I mean, the zero trust architecture definitely takes a leap ahead when you're leveraging both of those solutions together. Um, but uh, it, it really goes back to that why that Sean was talking about. We, we need to understand the why of what someone's doing and SailPoint helps us understand that so that we can then in our product grant them the privilege uh, of what they need or what they're doing. Um, so yeah, I absolutely think that these two products together will bring a stronger zero trust posture. Um, but for me and my mindset, as I've had these conversations, um, I continue to say that zero trust is a direction that we head even more than the defined architecture, the concept that we are never gonna trust anything. We're gonna constantly re-verify. Um, I, I love the analogy of, of the movie tickets. Um, in my movie theater, we get checked for our tickets twice. We have to have them to get in the lobby and then we have to have them to get to the theaters. So we're kind of like halfway there. 
Um, but no, I, I love that analogy. And that's one of the things that SailPoint helps bring to the table with Beyond Trust is that uh, constant attestation of, of roles and attributes that we can then assign rights or privileges um, and again, we can leverage the application concept that we talked about earlier. Okay, this role gets access to this application, those kinds right. of things. So. Josh, if, if I have to be, if my tickets are being checked twice at your movie theater, I'm going to watch it from home. Um, <laughs> uh, let's, do, let's go to our first poll question. Alyssa, uh, put up the poll question for the folks. Where does identity security and privilege access management rank on your list of priorities and projects? All right. I'm told I cannot vote. Um, we'll wait till that comes up. In the meantime, let's get to another question. Um, uh, David asked, and, and can I, uh, go ahead. Yeah, panelists can't vote. I don't know why, but uh, it's a yeah. feature. <laughs> you know, Tom, I'd, I'd, I'd say not a priority if it was me, but you know, that's just me. Uh, let's do another question while the poll comes up. Uh, David asks, and Ken, I think this may be for you. He didn't say it's specifically for you, but I'll, I'll throw it at you. All right, there's our agent, there's our um, uh, responses. Top priority at my agency. There you go. Identity security is top priority. All right. Uh, David asks, uh, I note the blockchain community is, is talking about having identity solutions, um, self sovereign identity solutions for organizations such as the Turkish Ministry of Foreign Affairs, United Nations Development Program. Any movement in the U.S. government to use blockchain identity? I don't know if that's I'm throwing it. You can because you work at GSA, but that's the only reason. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as far as I know, there's no government-wide initiative. Um, you know, you have federal government, state, local, tribal, territorial. It's possible one of the other <clears throat> governance may be working on on something. Actually, DHS Science and Technology S and T uh, just published a, I guess, a white paper on uh, government use cases for uh, self-sovereign identity. I mean, I'm personally interested in it, you know, the, the decentralized nature where, you know, you can bring your identity that's verified somewhere to somewhere else and they'll trust it because there's integrity uh, associated with it. Uh, but I'm not aware of any US government, federal government projects uh, around uh, self-sovereign identity. Anybody else want to jump in on that? Otherwise, we can move to another question. Just open it up to the panelists. I just, I, to be fair, I also know uh, NIST, they have their lab, but they're working with a number of vendors on Z Zero Trust, and there may be one or two in there. They may be doing something toward uh, blockchain and identity, but that would just be a stab in the dark for me. All right. All right. Uh, Chris writes, and this is interesting, and um, Ida, maybe this is something um, that would apply to you as well. Um, is there any consideration to look into the use of decentralized identities instead of a central PKI? I don't know if, I, if, if that's something that, that you guys are starting to look at or if that's something more for Sean or Ken or, or Josh. No, we're not looking at that yet. Let me, let me take that from a different way, Jason, if I could. So again, going back to the zero trust memo, uh, one of the first things on that second page I mentioned earlier is about having that enterprise level identity, having that enterprise level at the organization, whether it's the CIO office or CISO's office. I think one thing that we found as we talk to agencies across the spectrum of agencies is one of the questions agencies are asking is really who owns the identity mission at the agency? Uh, sometimes the, the shops think it's the active director team, other ones think it's the PKI team, others think it's the PIV or CAC team. And maybe now you have identity SaaS solutions, you have the IS vendors that have their identity access management. And so I, I think it kind of flipping that question around, I understand the reason for decentralized, but at the same time, there may be a collapsing of some of the identity uh, service providers or just who, who directs that mission inside the agency itself, I think is one of the ones that'll be interesting to watch as we uh, move out with the strategy. Yeah, I'll add, I'll add in there too. So the ICAM subcommittee under the Federal CISL Council has a identity lifecycle management working group going on right now. And that's one of the questions that came up is, you know, how is, how is an identity defined within the government? Is it owned by an agency? Is it, is it owned by the government? And then how, 
how does that identity move between uh, between different agencies? And I'll, I mean, I'll a little bit more of that question is instead of decentral identities in from a central PKI, you know, if we look at the OMB, um, or the Federal Zero Trust Strategy, it talks about phishing resistant authenticators. Most likely agencies will use PIV. Um, but uh, there's other types of phishing resistant authenticators that are not PKI based, P PIV being PKI based. So it will be interesting to see um, because NIST is coming out. They just published FIPS 201 3 that kind of alludes to non PKI based um, authenticators. And I believe they're updating their derived PIV to be a little bit more non PKI agnostic. I think that's 800 157. So yeah, there is there is some movement potentially away from using a centralized PKI, not toward decentralized identities. But uh, so I'll also throw out there and <laughs> I think about it. I mean, within OMB memo 1917, right? Our latest kind of ICAM policy, it does kind of direct agencies to move beyond credential management to identity management. Um, and that's another, that's another element that the uh, lifecycle management working group is looking at is what, what, is, what does that mean? How do we move beyond managing PIB to just managing to more focused on managing identities. Josh, I don't know if you want to touch upon this too. Is are you getting a lot of requests from government clients for non-identity PIVs or, or, or non-PKI related PIVs? Um, um, non PKI related <laughs> identities. <laughs> right. So uh, yes, we we are having conversations around non-identity related um, users. Uh, the application to application concept, the concept that um, so many of the accounts and things that we have to manage inside an environment um, are no longer actual identities that can use an MFA solution, even the phishing resistant MFA solution um, does require some planning and thought, especially as we continue towards this zero trust architecture the ability of these accounts to not be hard-coded or built in um, to prevent the, the classic breaches that we've seen. Um, these are all concepts that we have seen and we have conversations around uh, on a weekly basis with our customers. All right, we have about a couple more minutes left before the end of the panel. So let me uh, go one last question from Christian. Uh, Christian writes, the federal zero trust strategy requires agencies to ensure their EDR endpoint detection and response tools meet CIS's technical requirements. I'm curious if anyone on the panel could see something similar being required for identity management tools. I don't know if Sean or Ken want to jump in and start. Yeah, this is Sean. I'll, I'll start where, where the EDR really came out of the solar winds response in terms of, you know, the, the, the momentum was there actually all the way back to cyber EO. Um, I haven't, I'm not aware of anything towards that interest toward the identity itself uh, as a response, if you will, to, to a, a attack, but there is an interest, this whole conversations around identity. And so there is an interest across uh, the leadership about how to better be aware of identity. What are some services that can be, uh, you know, assumed? I think, uh, even on the outside, really, when I mean the outside, I mean outside the federal enterprise, you look at login.gov and some of the stuff they're doing and how they've been invested with new resources for the TMF fund. So there is an interest in supporting identity in different ways, uh, much more than we have in the past. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just add on there. I mean, CDM, CDM has its own technical requirements. I mean, one of, one of the major ones that um, align, definitely align with zero trust is creating that master user record. And uh, you know, multiple people have talked about today is you may have different personas like Ken Myers, I'm an employee, Ken Myers might be an admin, but I'm still Ken Myers at GSA. So that would be, that's my master user record. So that when Ken Myers, if and when, you know, I ever leave GSA, I no longer become an admin, that that admin privilege is then removed, but I still maintain my other, um, you know, the, the, the best example there would be if you had like two siloed systems. And I think there is, I mean, there's a couple of breaches that we can point to where this happened, where an administrator was fired, their employee credential was revoked, but because the, their uh, admin credential is this other system that's not connected, they still had access and, you know, uh, you know, could potentially take that system down. So, I mean, definitely looking at CDM 
for, for requirements, or at least uh, they have a technical uh, reference architecture as well um, for some best practices. Shameless plug also with our FICAM playbooks. Uh, we also have maybe not technical, uh, but at least programmatic best practices. Um, and if you have other questions, technical or otherwise, you can always reach out to our office at ICAM at gsa.gov. All right, I see Tom popped up. Tom, I was gonna do one last poll question because I've been uh, derelict in my duty. Is, do we have time for it? I, I actually got, yeah, yeah, we do, go ahead. All right, <laughs> Alyssa, throw up the poll question since Tom's gonna give me the hook. Privilege access management, including your agency zero trust strategy. I certainly hope so. Ida, I'll ask you to answer the poll question live. How are you guys dealing with privilege access management since uh, uh, a lot of the questions seem to go to Ken and Sean today? No problem. Um, <laughs> privilege access management is one of our biggest concerns, again, because of the level of access they've had. And um, one of the things that we're definitely looking, you know, interested in is the JIDA concept, where we don't just give access to um, every admin all the time. And what we're looking at is trying to, you know, look at structures of what needs to be done when, and if you need access to that um, resource, and how long, how long, and who needs access to the resources. Um, one of the things we looked, what we were seeing is that, you know, from a security perspective, from security, we have to, you know, probably trust the security people uh, more because because of the monitoring. And so some of that we're moving to the tools to say, okay, you know, is does the tool need it or does the um, uh, admins, the SOC operators need it? So we're looking at that to definitely how to reduce that. And another uh, interesting thing that we were talking about, Ken mentioned is also tying that to the HR systems. Um, we, when people change jobs, do we know enough to say, okay, now you no longer need privileged access. You, you, know, you change a different job or you're no longer with the agency. So sometimes there's a time lapse between when we get notified that that person is no longer here and to remove that complete access. So we're looking at also um, um, how we can shrink that time gap. All right, a uh, lot more to talk to Tom. As I think, uh, Tom, I think we're at the we're at the limit anyway. So let's give our uh, panelists a round of applause. Unless if I got more time, Tom, I got more time. No, <laughs> you give me the I'm Sean, sure. oh, Ida, okay. Josh. Thank you very much. Nice job as always. Appreciate thank it. You. Uh, thank I you. will throw it back to you, Tom. Take it away. So Jason, Jason, and I have this argument about should we go forty five minutes or half an hour. I was actually on his side and he did such a great job on the 30 minutes. I'm starting to think 30 minutes is good. But Jason, we will have time right now, but at the end, we're going to do a poll to see if people like 45 minute panels or 30 minute panels. An hour, you know hour panels, an hour. hour. Oh my God. Yeah. I, yeah. I think video killed the radio star. I don't know. This video got to move around a little bit. Thank you all. That was just fantastic. Uh, and next we have, and I always love doing these things. We have uh, Maury Haber. And um, Maury is the Chief Security Officer of Beyond Trust. And Maury, I was looking at your background. I think we went to high school around the same time. So we got, we got Gen X represented. How, how are you doing today? I'm doing wonderful. Yourself? Good, good. And, and where are you based? I'm in Orlando, Florida, but uh, my Gen X roots are back up in New York. Good, good, good. Well, I look forward to your discussion. I, 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 you know, you guys service a lot of customers, commercial, federal, and, and I, I'm looking forward to your perspective. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Let me go ahead and make sure I can share my screen appropriately. Can you see that window? I'm assuming you can. Yes, we can. I, yeah. Yes, we can. Thank you. Hey, on a Mac, I never know if it's going to work or not, so I always have to ask. It's a pleasure speaking with everyone today. My name is Maury Haber. I'm the Chief Security Officer here at Beyond Trust, and I want to talk to you about a federal technology overview. First off, as introduced, um, I've been in the industry for quite a bit of years. I'm also an author. I have four books on covering privileged access management, vulnerability management, identity governance, um, and a fourth one coming out shortly on cloud attack vectors and how to mitigate uh, those threats that will be available in Q2. At Beyond Trust, I oversee the security for my organization as well as all of our SaaS solutions. And I really have been doing this uh, to me forever, 
of, but first got started building military flight simulators for a company called ECC back in the early 1990s, uh, C-17 and a variety of other aircraft. But enough about me, let me get to the meat of what we're talking about today. Uh, what is a privileged account and why you should care? One thing that I've seen in the federal space is that the definition of privileged account is different than commercial. Any account created that is managed under an identity in the federal space is privileged in some way, shape, or form. It has privileges to do something. When there is none created, none accessed, not even guessed, then it doesn't exist. But in the commercial world, privileged accounts almost always re, uh, are referred to as administrator or root or some type of super user account. So that definition, when looking at vendors and tool sets, sometimes gets a little blurry because the corporate definition is very different than the federal definition. For this case, we're gonna talk about any account and its identity relationship that has privileges that could be abused, that could cause harm, that could cause uh, an outage or the exfiltration of data. Now, when we think about all the technologies we are deploying, have deployed and trying to make our lives better with, we realize we now have privileged accounts in more roles than just those administrators and those database admins than ever before. We have administrators for all sorts of accounts, whether they're application stewards, as one of my colleagues mentioned earlier, machine to machine, whether we have them for developers, whether we have them for help desk personnel to remotely help us fix a problem, administrate a problem, or even push patches. There are more privileged accounts than ever before, basically due to digital transformation and the amount of technology that has been introduced to our lives every day and enabled us in personal world, commercial world, and in the federal space to be more efficient. These are on-premise, they're hybrid, they're aircraft in the cloud. Just think of all of those special accounts that if abused could cause a problem. Now we've seen from the previous poll that privileged access management, PAM, is critical is a part of our strategies because what we need to do is understand who has access to what. We need to be able to run that certification, that attestation report to say, here are the identities, here are the associated accounts, and this is what they could do. Here at Beyond Trust, we take it from the other perspective. Think of those privileged accounts again. What did they actually do with those accounts? What systems did they access? What did they do? How did they behave, et cetera? This is more than just getting a log saying, I've authenticated and I've run the program. This can be complete IO transactional logs, screen recordings, seeing what keystrokes they've clicked in, et cetera, to actually monitor behavior in real time in accordance with things like zero trust. When you combine the two together, when you create that Venn diagram and that overlap, you find out, is that access appropriate? Should they have access? Did they have access? What did they do? And the verification. This not only answers who, what, where, and why, but also was it appropriate? It brings us to why this is so important. And one of my colleagues mentioned earlier that siloed approach can bring blind spots. If you think of identity governance and all the disciplines in identity access management from two-factor to uh, single sign-on, et cetera, and privilege access management is silos, you're not appropriately sharing information or exchanging information to see if something was done appropriate. You basically have said, I've got some place that I'm doing identity governance, I've got someplace else doing single sign-on, and I'm gonna monitor activity. But that identity account relationship needs to be shared between them and the behavior or inappropriate behavior documented and shared between the solutions as well. So if something bad happens in the PAM world where access is granted inappropriately, it affects the identity governance aspect. It's not left to a report, alert, an email, something where someone has to go back in and say, you know what? They haven't used that permission or that right in a long time as a privileged user, and they just tried to, maybe we should flag it, turn it off for now, and go through that additional change control or that work order to make sure that, yeah, they haven't touched it in six months. Why is it being hit now? That goes to the attack vector that, again, one of my colleagues spoke about earlier for potentially leftover accounts or mover type of accounts that were not properly reconciled as a person goes through the business. Now, all of this leads to never trust, always verify for zero trust. When you think of privileged access management, we know we want to verify the user every time through identity governance, through their access solutions, and then what privileges they have. You're going to realize what was the context. 
How did they do it? When did they do it? Was it an ephemeral created account or ephemeral based permissions? Was it just in time? Did they access it from a geolocation they weren't supposed to or from a machine that wasn't trusted? It was a build that was not issued by the agency or government entity. And then finally, intelligently managing that access, looking for inappropriate behavior. Did they try to launch a command shell? Did they try to open a website they shouldn't? Did they do something potentially nefarious, even if it's behavioral based? Because the whole point of zero trust is to audit everything and never assume that everything is working correctly. When you bundle privilege access management as a part of this for all of your sensitive accounts, that again, if misused could be the liability to the agency, that's how privilege access management solves your zero trust problems. Now we do this with four different solutions. Now beyond trust as indicated um, does provide privilege access management solutions, what we call ident intelligent identity and access management solutions. We do not say our products are zero trust. Actually, there are no products that are zero trust. We enable zero trust architectures with these products so that you can realize the goals that you've been asked to achieve. This includes the privileged password management capabilities. Okay, it looks like we've lost audio. Hold on. I can hear you. Uh, okay. We're good. Now it's back. Okay. How far back did you lose me or should I just keep going? We heard every word. Okay. So only some of you lost. So I'll keep on going. So just as I started with this slide, Beyond Trust does not believe that products are zero trust. Even when you look at the NIST 800-207 recommendations, there are no products. It is an architecture. It's a philosophy. It's a discipline. So in order to enable basically a zero trust architecture, we look at it in these four different pillars. The first being privilege password management, the ability to check in, check out an ephemeral or just in time create privileges and do all of the session recording with behavioral monitoring for the most sensitive of systems. We also do secure remote access. This is for two different use cases, for the help desk to provide help regardless of where the end user is and for privilege remote access. You might start hearing a term called VPAM or vendor privilege access management. This is where you need to have a third party vendor access a system potentially internally or in the cloud, but you don't wanna create their accounts or instantiate them in your directory services. They just need to do work for a finite period of time, but you're not gonna enable RDP, SSH, VNC, or even allow them to access it via browser via VPN. The privilege remote access solution gives you that conduit into the application or the service without the need to open up or expose ports and provides a zero trust architecture in order to do so, whether on cloud, on premise, or even via air gapped, which is unique for beyond trust. The endpoint privilege management solutions remove administrative rights on Unix, Linux, Windows, and Mac. This technology is patented by beyond trust. We do not elevate the end user. We actually keep the user at a standard user and remove all of their local or network privileges. When the application is launched, we use patented technology to swap the security token for the application, which gets elevated. The user can still interact with it, but even techniques like pass the hash can't steal the token, the hash, because it's only valid for that application on that system for that time and will not work across the network. So even things like updaters or adding a printer or changing a clock can operate, but it doesn't work anywhere else. And it's only for that instance of runtime. Finally, cloud security management. We live in a multi-cloud world. We have a ton of different types of systems running in the cloud and we're granting users and privileges for them. The last count, there were over 60,000 types of entitlements that you can grant in AWS. How do you know if they've been assigned correctly or not? If you've been following the news, there was a massive breach in South America yesterday with over 3 million accounts leaked. And it literally was just for something as simple as an S3 bucket being misconfigured. How do you know if two factors enabled? How do you know what groups are enabled? How do you audit, make those recommendations and then properly secure them? That's what the cloud security management solution is about. It's all about those privileges and entitlements in the cloud. Now we do this in a variety of products, all integrated together, 
But the reason we're unique is because we do have that discovery and onboarding capabilities that when a new system is found, we automatically onboard it and place it under management. This really helps with shadow IT or other types of uh, rogue systems that may be out there. We have advanced threat analytics and reporting that help us with that user behavior piece. And we are a fully hardened appliance or cloud offering so that it becomes nearly turnkey to set up and start using the solutions to enable you on your zero trust journey and provide better intelligent identity and access management. We cover almost every major platform out there from Windows, Mac, Unix, Linux, IoT, network devices, et cetera. And you'll find us in a lot of places that use critical infrastructure to provide that secure remote gateway into those systems, especially when their legacy systems are end of life where there is no other way to manage them. If you follow the zero trust models from 800-207, that's more inclined to an enclave approach where you're still using a perimeter or a bubble to secure those systems, we can accommodate that as well. And then finally, never having shared passwords or reused passwords or any type of secret, whether it's a key or a certificate, any place. We keep everything unique, we keep everything rotated, and when a privileged user needs to access them, they don't copy and paste it or have to copy it down, copy it down. It's auto-injected into the session so that it is dynamically available to them. And when they finish, it's basically lost. So if you have to hard code them in applications or scripts, you're essentially using an API to get them for that time as well. Now, Beyond Trust for government agencies really excels. We understand the problem. We've been doing this a long time. Myself, Josh, and a few others have been involved with government work for many years. We understand what you're looking for. I know that may sound a little cavalier, but we've been supporting you as a vendor for many years, all the way back to the days of retina vulnerability scanning and SCIVI uh, contracts, et cetera. We have been recognized by Gartner as a leader in many of these places, in many of the agencies that are out there. And I know I'm running a little low on time. I'll let you just read the rest of the screen. I'm sorry? No, you're good. Go finish up. You're, you're okay. fine. Sorry. sorry. <laughs> no worries. Um, and as you'll find, if you look into us a little further, we are considered the leader from Gartner, Forrester, and Cuppinger Cole in terms of providing this type of solutions. To back that up, we have a wide variety of federal customers. Yes, this is our brag list, but brand recognition is critically important to what we do because when you can see that your peers are using the technology successfully to solve these problems, hopefully it'll give you confidence. Many of you may know some of the peers in these, in, in these agencies and be able to tell you how well we've been able to solve their privilege problems, how we've been able to remove administrative rights and how we've really been able to achieve many of the goals of Zero Trust, again, using an architectural perspective because there is no product. We are solving for the seven tenants by removing rights, checking for lease privilege, verifying access, recording everything, and then checking user behavior at the same time. Now, as we talked about that silo approach before, you can't do any of this without good integrations. There was that integration that was spoken about earlier between SailPoint and Beyond Trust. We solved that in a zero trust method by sharing the identities and verifying access in real time so if the identity governance from SailPoint says they should or should not have access or they belong to this role, we are applying privilege access to that based on SailPoint being the record of authority and then reporting back to them a report saying this is what they actually did. These vendors here help us keep that siloed approach out of your perspective by providing detailed integrations into things like Tenable IO detailed integrations into automation such as Blue Prism or Palo Alto, et cetera. This helps you everything from an ITSM environment, the service now that might be in FedRAMP to say, yes, appropriate behaviors were taken for change control and applied and done, et cetera, all the way through the identity governance perspective, perspective and your privileged accounts. Now, quick word on Beyond Trust. Uh, we're global, uh, over 20,000 customers worldwide over 75 patents, that's what I mentioned earlier, you will find our technology stack unique in the privileged access space because no other vendor can duplicate many of the pieces we have. Many of them will have to use impersonation accounts or do a fake run as. We are the only vendor that can truly elevate without any of these that techniques. We're headquartered in Atlanta, Georgia, privately held, and as I've indicated, market leader by all the leading uh, analyst firms from Gartner, Forrester, and Company Cole. Now, for your next steps, please check out these, this 20-minute video on the path to zero trust. We have a data sheet to accompany that as well. 
There's also a wide variety of data sheets on our website for each of those pillars that I talked about and how to achieve zero trust architectures. They also go into some caveats where some things just don't work like peer-to-peer -peer networks and certain legacy technologies that there just really is no good PAM or zero trust solution for. I'd encourage you to take a look at those papers. And finally, if you do have any questions, my contact information is on the bottom. It's the fastest 15 minute presentation I can give and hopefully you found it beneficial. Turn it back over, thank you. Yeah, or you kept that really uh, really tight. We appreciate your partnership. Is it okay if we send this, send this deck to our audience? I, I found it very educational. Absolutely. So uh, the team has a copy of it in PDF format. You're more than welcome to send it out. Okay. Great, great. Uh, well, thank you very much. And we look forward to your continued partnership. Uh, Maury Haber, CSO, uh, Beyond Trust. Thank you, Maury. You're very uh, welcome. Take next. care, everyone. Be safe. Yeah, thank you. Hopefully we can get some of your weather. Uh, <laughs> next, uh, we have our friend, Jory Heckman with us. Jory, are you on? With the Fed hey, News Network, Tom. I'm still radio, you know, for about the next ten years until I adjust. How are you doing, Jory? Doing all right. Hey, you know, I'm uh, as guilty of it myself. The the radio network uh, switch over. It's been years, and I'm still uh, still working on it sometimes. But uh, thanks yeah. for having me on. And uh, wow, yeah, shaping up to be a Federal News Network double feature here. Jason did a great job earlier today, and happy to keep the ball rolling here. Um, and happy to lead the, the discussion here on privilege access uh, in just a moment here. Uh, but please, please keep those questions rolling in. Uh, I think you've been doing a great job as an audience for uh, engaging with the conversation, asking questions on your own, and making sure that we uh, take some time to do so. I think that's really important. Um, and I'm going to make sure that we set aside time to get those questions. Um, and beyond that, want to make sure that we uh, get time for those poll questions. So. Everyone gets their CPE credits by the end of the day here. Um, and with that said, uh, I will introduce our great panel here. We have a great lineup of folks. We have, uh, and please just give a wave when I say your name so we all know who is who. Uh, we have Trefenia Salzman, the security, uh, a security architect over at the Small Business Administration. We have Sanjay Gupta, the chief technology officer also at SBA. We have Robert Wood, the Chief Information Security Officer and the Director of Information Security and Privacy Group at the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which is, of course, part of HHS. And back at it again, we have Josh Broadbent, the Regional Vice President for Public Sector Solutions Engineering at Beyond Trust. Uh, everyone, thanks for taking the time. And I'll give everyone just a quick opportunity to introduce themselves a little more fully, but as part of doing so, uh, maybe just tell me a little bit more about uh, what identity and privilege access management means for your agency right now in terms of meeting the mission. Uh, Trefenia, I'll turn it over to you first. Hey everyone, thank you so much for having me on. I'm very excited to be here. I love the ATARC events, they're pretty great. Um, yeah, so at the SBA, we're looking at, we were already looking at the um, White House OMB memo that just dropped, I think last week or very recently. Um, I know there was a draft version that came out at the end of last year. So we're really working on that and preparing our way to make sure that we're in line with what that looks like and what they're requesting us to do. Okay, great. And Sanjay, uh, let's keep on the SBA thread here and mm -hmm. let's hear from you a little bit more. Yeah. I, hello. Good morning, everybody. And thank you, Jory, for having me back on this panel. Uh, like Trafinia said, uh, SBA, as some of you may be aware, has been leading um, one of the leading agencies in terms of cloud-based modernization, as well as cloud-based cybersecurity models. Uh, and I've had the opportunity to lead some of that uh, implementations and we'll talk more about it. Uh, we have had implementations uh, starting as back as in 2017, 2018, that uh, even though zero trust was not a concept that was actively discussed, uh, we had already started laying the foundation uh, back then as well. And we have continued to accelerate the implementation across our, our landscape. Uh, and, and so certainly we're happy to share our experiences as we oh, talk further here uh, and, and the role of uh, privileged access management and, and the work that we're doing in that dimension. So glad to be here again. Glad to have you, Sanjay. And Robert, let's uh, hear a little bit more about how you see CMS uh, taking on these subjects of identity and uh, access management. 
Sure. So to me, I think it's uh, it's it's really essential that we embrace identity from a, you know, this is a human operating in our environment to this is a system or a service uh, operating in our environment. And it, like we need to, we need the mechanisms, the process to, and, uh, and I guess the, the like the policy engines to support both kinds of identity and, uh, and, and sort of integrate that with the, the zero trust principles and, and, and all of that. So it's, you know, it's not enough just to be focused on like, you know, MFA and, and, you know, phishing resistant 2FA and, and, and all, all of that sort of stuff. It's like, you really want to make sure that a service, um, you know, that, it, that the services talking to one another within your environment are, uh, that you have a, kind of a, a chain of, a chain of attestation and, and validation um, from build to who contributed to it all the way up to, uh, you know, deployment and operation. So, um, you know, we are, very much focused on the, the the broader swath of of like what it means to have an identity. All right, great. Thanks for that, Robert and uh, Josh. Let's uh, hear from you. You have a, a unique perspective on this panel in terms of you know setting a, a wider zoomed out perspective on this. Uh, you know, in terms of identity access management. Uh, you know, what should agencies be uh, keeping their eye on right now? Yeah, um, obviously there's a lot of movement around this uh, in the federal government with the OMB memo coming out last week um, and the, uh, the second uh, national security memo coming out the, just a couple of days before that. Um, right now, as, as we're doing this, really just, I know this is going to sound crazy, but keeping our eye on the ball. Um, of all the things that we have to keep our eye on, making sure that we understand that there's a plethora of technologies out there that are all claiming to be some form of zero trust, as some of them claiming to be, um, you know, your end all be all, some of them claiming just little niche corners of it. But at the end of the day, making sure that we are focused on securing these identities uh, in a way that we, we never trust anything, we're constantly re-verifying them to make sure that uh, our security is, uh, is still handling the fundamentals of security. Um, this week, a breach was announced, or not a breach was announced, but one of the security research firms announced that they found over 20,000 HP ILO cards in data centers that were internet facing with default passwords. Like, as we're doing this kind of stuff, we have to remember that basic security tenants still apply. And we have to manage those privileged accounts, those, those um, items that could give essential access as we're configuring um, data centers and networks and things like that. Yeah, yeah, all good points to frame the rest of the conversation. Thanks for that, Josh. And since uh, a fair number of you mentioned this already, let's kind of drill down onto this a little bit more. The new zero trust strategy from the White House last week, uh, you know, obviously this is going to be a continued priority for uh, the years to come here, this is not just a, you know, a passing fad. Um, and this is going to be, you know, a going concern for agencies for quite some time here. Uh, just in, in regards to this new strategy and this, this, you know, these new uh, directives for agencies to follow here, um, you know, how does that, you know, elevate or raise the profile of uh, what has already been done at your agencies? Uh, Trefenia, I'll start with you on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I like about this OMB memo um, is that it kind of sets the first steps of zero trust. Um, like uh, Robert was saying that it's not the whole picture. And like Josh was saying, to keep your eyes on the ball, the end goal is to get to that NIST 800-207, you know, trust algorithm um, journey. But in order to get there, we kind of have to do the first few steps, which is the MFA that's um, restricting the special characters, the password rotation. It's those types of things that kind of set the stage and kind of have the conversations internally with your security team, your operations team, and then also with the um, like department heads and the other offices that are within the agency. It kind of starts those types of conversations and it, it allows you to then, you know, take it to the next level. So I would say the OMB memo is something that we're using as kind of a stepping stone and something to move us in the direction of zero trust, but it's not the end game. 
All right. Thanks for that, Trifenia. And uh, Sanjay, anything you'd like to add from the SBA perspective? Yeah, I think just an, an additional viewpoint is that uh, I think it was said earlier, uh, zero trust is a mindset shift. It's not a tool or a specific technology that you can say, okay, I implement this tool or tool sets or this stack, and now I've reached zero trust. So it's it's a basically a paradigm. It's a model. It's a concept. It's it's and so what does that mean? Um, there's also an element of it. I know we are all folks, you know, um, mostly in the technology area talking about it. But there is an aspect of it which requires a different approach to how we look at policies from a business standpoint and mission standpoint. And what we've done in the past is no longer going to be you know, relevant and valid. So this it'll require us to change the way we approach things. So design and security by design is something I've been talking about for the last five years I've been in the federal space is that this is a starting point. It is not an afterthought. You cannot say, oh, I need to do something on security. I'm ready to launch a product or a solution. And now let me see, what do I need from security? Oh, they need ATOs and other stuff. No, uh, you have to start with security as a fundamental design requirement from the get-go. That's a mind shift change. It's the approach how you look at things. Things that we've traditionally done, I'll just use a simple example uh, just for the audience purposes, and it's not necessarily illustrative for the overall zero trust architecture, but you know, you know, the traditional models of uh, VPN connectivity uh, are not necessarily going to be, you know, meet the, the requirement of a zero trust approach here, right? You know, in the old model of uh, VPN, you, you connected in, you authenticated, and now you had the access to the, uh, you know, the entire environment and you were never reconfirmed or revalidated till your session completed or dropped or you reconnected. And that's no longer going to be sufficient given this approach here. So, so what I'm trying to say here is it it's requires a fundamental way of approaching things, designing things, looking at things. Uh, it's not just a technology pay, uh, play, it is a business and a policy requirement also that needs to change uh, along with the technology element, so. Excellent, thanks for that, Sanjay. And uh, Robert, you know, this is again, something that we have seen from the administration time and again, uh, but what stands out to you from your perspective from this latest strategy that we saw from the White House and OMB last week? Um, I, I think one of the the most significant things is like I like I love the big bold the big bold direction that we're that we're aiming to uh, that we're aiming to go. Um, what is you know there there's a there's an irony in in all of this that we're we're in the we're pushing for this massive um paradigm shift without um or you know while simultaneously operating in this um you know with with these sort of um like weights around our ankles uh in the form of you know big clunky policy big clunky uh procurement uh, procurement flows that we can't like rapidly experiment uh, with things with these, uh, you know, so you've got everything from like the CR to the FAR to the, um, you know, to, to other just big policy that makes it hard to sort of test and learn your way through how, um, like how something is going to work in your environment. And, and honestly, I think that like that sort of encourages or, or, suggests in a way that you're going to have to like plan everything out and you're going to have to get it just right because the way that you know all of this procurement stuff works in the in the federal space like you have to you have to do all of this this work up front to make sure that you get um you know you you sort of write down into into requirements and all this you know sort of precisely what it is you're looking for and and I think, you know, if you just accept that like zero trust is a model and all models are wrong, but some are useful, then like you're not going to get it right on the first pass that you go. Yet there's it's 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 sort of we're creating this situation for ourselves that is, um, you know, it's big and it's bold and it's potentially too big to fail, which admittedly makes me nervous. So like, you know, one of the things that we're really trying to lean in on is like, how can we create like minimum viable experience experiments to sort of test and learn our way through how to do steps along the way in this zero trust journey, because it's like, I, I, I can assuredly say like, we do not have all the answers with what it is, uh, you know, with the things that we're doing 
and we're going to get some things wrong and that's okay. And we will learn and adapt as we, as we go. But like, you know, the, I, I think the, like, not all like procurement capabilities and such, I think are, are, you know, a really useful thing to think about here because even, um, even things like, uh, uh, like there's a lot of tooling that supports zero trust, uh, some of the zero trust principles. A lot of that is delivered in, um, you know, in software as a service sort of models. A lot of that software as a service is not fed ramped and not all agencies have like AOs that are willing to stand up and say like, I'm going to, like, I'm going to authorize this for use because the opportunity outweighs the risk in our particular environment, despite it not being fed ramped, or I'm going to go you know, out on a limb and like have my team support this, you know, this solution for FedRAMP, um, you know, agency sponsorship, et cetera. And, and so we, it like, there's all of these sort of nuanced uh, sort of wrinkles that, that I believe are, are like going to make the journey like harder. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's like the, the difference between like walking on a, you know, a smooth paved path and like, you know, going for a hike, it's like, it's just going to be harder because there's more things to trip over. Yeah. Yeah. And just to maybe pull that thread just a little bit more in terms of those minimum viable, you know, pilots, experiments, whatever you want to call them, you know, are there any good uh, use cases of, of anything that, you know, you'd like to uh, share with the audience? So, so like, uh, uh, I mean, I, I don't want to dominate the time here with, with our own sort of experience, but like, you know, some specific things that we're, uh, that we're trying are like uh, doing is so, so a lot of work is dominated or centered around, uh, or a lot of identity and access management stuff is centered around PIV cards or CAC cards, uh, depending on the environment you're in. And so like PIV and CAC cards are not like, you know, you, you, like you have to have like external readers if you're using a MacBook Pro, a lot of times uh, contractors, uh, you know, like getting them through the screening process is uh, like takes more time, et cetera, et cetera. So like we're, we're experimenting uh, or like looking at and looking to experiment with um, like certificate derived uh, YubiKeys to still do like uh, uh, sort of identity verified actions in like DevSecOps development oriented environments. So like signed commits, um, you know, YubiKey enable logins and, and, and things like that, where we can kind of have this traceability through an environment. And like, I don't know if that'll work. I don't know if it'll jive with our like broader sort of IT environment, um, but in an environment where we're hosting FISMA systems and, and seeking to enable like continuous ATO and, and, and uh, like really resilient um, and secure, safe, continuous deployment, then like that's, that seems to be like a viable approach based on, based on our current sort of research and, and, and it looks promising. But like, it's not a hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, very uh, thought provoking all the same. Uh, and Josh, I'll turn it on over to you in terms of, you know, what stands out to you on this, uh, this latest uh, strategy from the White House? What stands out to you as the thing that agencies uh, will maybe, you know, have to elevate or, or change gears on more than anything else? Um, yeah, so as, as I read through the memo, you know, I'm, I'm at least encouraged by the fact that we're acknowledging this is a big, bold step, that it's not where we were. As Sanjay said earlier, you know, we never designed networks with security in mind. We designed them with ease of use in mind and hoped that we could add on security later. Um, the, the analogy that I use for this all the time is it's like we built the zoo, except we didn't build any cages. And we just threw all the animals in there and said, we'll come back and build cages later. Um, so now we're short a few zebras and we're trying to figure out what to do. Um, you know, the, the thing that as, as I read through it, a few things really stood out to me. Um, and the, one of those things is that it, it, literally calls out that it, it sets a baseline um, for access control for government that prioritizes this defense. Um, I talked in the earlier panel about my mindset around zero trust being a direction that we're heading, that it's more than an architecture, it's not a product, it's a mindset that we have. And I think that calling out the fact that they say it's a baseline and not a target is very important. 
um, the way that we have to defend and secure our networks uh, using identity-based security is going to constantly evolve. We don't get to just sit back and go, okay, well, we think we've implemented five or six products that are integrated and now we have achieved zero trust. That's not the way that this is going to work. We're going to constantly be adding, um, we're going to constantly be adding, you know, machine learning algorithms, understanding user behavior and user behavior analytics um, to points that were made earlier, understanding where users normally log in from, contextualizing their requests. All of those things are going to have to happen as we continue towards that zero trust progress. Um, so just understanding that this memo is the start. Even though it's a huge jump, it's still just the start of making ourselves in a defensible position. Just the start. Yeah, of course. And uh, Sanjay, I was getting some head nods from you on this point. Uh, would you like to unpack that a little bit further? Yeah, thank you, Jory. So a couple of other sort of reflections I should offer at the macro level here. So, you know, we've seen many executive orders, you know, around cyber and others. So a few high level attributes I want to point out. This one is a very specific one. When I say specific, meaning there is specific outcomes that are expected. It is not prescriptive in saying use blue colored things or purple colored things or green colored things. They're defining the outcomes and they're saying, here's your target date for reporting your progress of the outcome. So I like that aspect of this uh, executive order because it is specific, it is clear, it is not left ambiguous to say, well, you can do whatever you want to do. They're saying, this is the outcome you need to achieve, and this is when why you need to achieve it. How you go about doing it, which tools and which colored tools you use, that's you know sort of left your discretion. So I think I want to point out that is a good way for executive orders and direction coming from OMB on this one, right? The second aspect I want to also point out is they are trying to reduce the ambiguity and they're trying to move the entire federal landscape forward. Now, remember all of these agencies, we have different missions, we have different uh, you know, levels of classified information we deal with or not. So this is sort of trying to be broad in that sense. So all agencies and all missions are able to gain uh, from, from this uh, uh, executive order while not limiting it only for, you know, for example, in the SBA, we don't deal with classified information, right? But uh, CMS, I'm sure probably deals with that uh, or other agencies that have a more classified nation of uh, major of their mission, right? So that's the other aspect I wanna point out there. And last but not the least, I wanna point out is that um, it's nice to see a, a, a effort which has got uh, unition with the CISA groups, uh, OMB, uh, and the federal CISO levels, right? So, so it's a combination of initiatives. It's not just sort of being done in a stovepipe manner. So those are some highlights about this executive order that I want to point out that is uh, really relevant and really um, refreshing uh, from sort of the recipient standpoint. Oh, good points there. Thanks, Sanjay. And I think it's time for our first poll question of the panel. Uh, Alyssa, if you can get that ready for everyone. All right, where do you currently stand in building your privilege access management strategy? Give everyone a second to fill that out. Oh, and we're kind of all over the map here. Uh, not encouraging. Thirty-one percent. I do not know. Uh, uh, that's uh, that's certainly not uh, not ideal, but um, that's uh, honest at the very least. Um, and uh, with that in mind, here uh, I will just uh, you know take the conversation in a different route here, and just uh, you know look at the conversation uh, this way here, in that. Um, it seems to be, uh, you know, certainly a, a bit of attention. Anything uh, of this topic here, you know, how ultimately your agency balances, you know, identity and privilege access, you know, from a data security perspective, while also managing ease of access for your end users. Um, you know, uh, let's throw it back to uh, to Robert on that one. Uh, just, you know, how you see that that careful balance working itself out over at CMS. 
Um, carefully. <laughs> so there, I mean, like anything, there is like we have to we have to kind of continuously gauge the like the 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 level of risk that we are uh, expected to mitigate with like doing a doing a chunk of work the level of investment that we have to pour into doing it and you know and balance that against everything else that we could or that we don't want to do um you know because choosing what you're going to do is just as much about choosing what you're not going to do and and so you know we we find ourselves in um in a very like fast loop iterative process so like instead of annual goals we have broken out on uh, the quarterly okrs we refresh and talk about them um on a on a quarterly basis we review them on um on a near weekly basis um they're transparent for everyone in the agency so like we're like we 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 try our best um and i know we still have room to improve to to approach our our work on everything from this to you know like everything else that goes into our security program in as iterative and like learn fast um learn fast and adapt uh, approach as we can all right thanks for that robert and uh trefenny i'll turn it back over to you to uh to hear you know more about that, that that kind of that trade off uh, as it plays out at SBA. Yeah, <clears throat> so it can be a little tricky. I would say for the people um, that thirty one percent that do not know, I would recommend um, identifying someone on your team, on your security team, or your operations team to lead the identity effort. We um, have someone who is really wonderful. He's very good at his job. He knows the. Uh, agency inside and out. So he's leading the charge when it comes to identity. And then to kind of break off, um, really, you have to take a step back and just really break it down. So for example, maybe if you're using Active Directory and you may have some um, additional uh, like tiers within there, I would say break it down try and simplify it and then have that person take the lead and move that initiative forward because it can be a little overwhelming, especially for that privileged access, you know, the privileged access piece of it. But if you just identify the users that have the privileged access first, um, so that's going to be your administrators and your architects, your engineers, they're probably going to have that privileged access dealing with that first and then maybe moving on to your service accounts. Um, that'll kind of at least get you in the set you in the right direction or move you forward. All right, Trefeni, you make a lot mm -hmm. of great points there. Sanjay, anything you'd like to build on from the uh, SBA perspective? Um, well, I'll make a generic comment on the survey result. And then uh, I think uh, Trefeni covered this. Uh, it's scary. I do not know if 31% is scary like hell, quite frankly. And the reason I say that is uh, privilege access management has been around for decades. It's not a new concept. People who do not need privilege should not have the privilege. Um, there are some basic 101s on privileged access management. You don't need any tools to do implementation of things like a review who all has access to privilege, uh, use, um, um, uh, elevated privileges and confirm if they still need those accesses. Uh, or if you need to uh, you know, downgrade their privileged access, then they need to do that as well. So, so there's so many things that really jump out at me and this is really scary if 31% of people are saying, I do not know. I think this is a cause, it's a red flag in my book and, and hopefully this is a data set which is an anomaly and not representing uh, the larger uh, federal landscape, but it is a scary response here in my view. We can pour over those numbers a little bit more and see. Uh you know, what, uh, what degree of validity we can, we can give those, but, um, uh, Josh, yeah, you know, based on that, based on, uh, the, uh, the rather upsetting poll question responses, uh, you know, what stands out to you in terms of, uh, you know, what we just heard from the audience, but also, you know, what, what, uh, what stands out to you in terms of, again, this, this careful trade-off between, you know, security and ease of access. Yeah. So, uh, I wish I could say that those poll results, uh, surprised me, but the truth is that they don't. Um, we've been having conversations among uh, my team of, of engineers about how 
a lot of times when we get in these conversations, people ask us about our products. They want to come in, they want to demo. And we realize that we're educating people on this topic more than we are giving them specific feature sets. Um, and what I realized is that, you know, we understood as network engineers, um, I, I ran an MSP for, for 20 years before I did this. Um, and then I specialized in Active Directory migrations for a little while, and then and then we uh, and then I moved on to identity and access management. And the thing that I realized is, you know, when we were doing basic network stuff, when we were doing Active Directory migrations, we would come in and we would spend three days whiteboarding the concept of an Active Directory migration. Who's impacted? How is this going to play out? What's going to happen? Um, who are the stakeholders here? How do we need to timeline this? And when it comes to privilege access management, nobody does that. They get a demo from their three favorite tools. Then they get a proof of concept to make sure that it fits their four use cases that they think somebody's telling them to do. And then they buy a product and they get to the point of implementation and they basically go, oh crap, how do we get from here to there? Because we didn't tell anybody we were going to do this. So now you've got 15 other groups that are going, well, we're not going to give you our privileges. We're not going to give that up. And so the entire concept is that in, in privilege, we've decided that it takes less organization and planning to, in shift, to, to shift our entire security mindset than it did to migrate Active Directory from one server to the other. And that just isn't the case. And so as a group, we have to understand that this shift from a perimeter-based mindset to an identity-based mindset and zero trust does require education. And it requires a conversation. And a lot of people don't know because we're still staring at this going, this is something that we are supposed to know, but we don't, and we don't know where to go next. And I think that's one of the challenges is everybody assumes that they're supposed to know something about this. And there are vendors out there that go, hey, pick me, pick me. And you know, we're one of them. So I'm not going to say too much about that. But at the end of the day, the truth is that people need the opportunity to have a conversation, uh, to be educated about the topic, and to have a conversation that helps them plan this journey. The reason they don't know is because no one's told them how to plan this. No one's told them how to architect this. They just know it's something they're supposed to do, and they're supposed to know how to do it. All right. Well, thanks for that, Josh. Uh, hard to believe, but we're running really close to time here. So uh, let's just uh, let's just go to poll question number two here. In your opinion, how how important is higher standards when it comes to privileged access management? While people are answering that, it sounds like our identity management group's work's not quite done yet, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah. Go. I wonder. I wonder uh, how uh, how we're going to see the I do not know uh, pop up again. Uh, yeah. Whether whether the first round results are any indication there. Not to skew the results here. Oh, I scared you away from the I do not know. Okay, very important. All right, you're. <laughs> I I don't know if uh, if our scolding uh, skewed those results or not, but uh, I'm glad to hear seventy two percent very important. Um, and hey, with that, we got an honest crowd. I mean, what do you want? I mean, you ask the question, at least yeah, they're yeah. honest. I, uh, I, I insist on nothing if not honesty. And so, uh, you know, we're really running close to time here, guys. So I'll give you a real quick lightning round, uh, 30 second uh, closing sentiments if uh, you'd like to offer those up. Uh, Robert, let's start with you. Yeah, I think. Um... You know, the, the thing that I think really any, everyone needs to emphasize is like, what is the, like, don't try to boil the ocean, but like, try to find the minimum viable, like first step that you can take. And, and then like, just keep learning from there with, you know, and keep your eye on the big, on the big picture. It's, um, there's a, there's a model of uh, like organizational strategy that I think really resonates here. That's, uh, it's called the ambidextrous, ambidextrous organization. So like recommend folks read up on that and like really embrace that kind of thinking as they're on this journey. All right, and uh, Trefeni, over to you. Yeah, I would say um, for all the engineers and architects out there, when you're creating these initiatives, um, make sure that when you're creating them that you show that it's in progress. 
for your chiefs and for your leadership. Um, they will thank you for it. If you can show, hey, this is what we're doing and this is how much we're moving the bar, it will be very much appreciative and then uh, your initiatives will keep being able to move forward. All right, and uh, Sanjay, any closing thoughts? Yeah, security by design, that would be my message. You cannot ignore security. You start with security and you continue to work with security. So do not make it an afterthought. This is a part and parcel of your design and make it an integral part of it. Number two, uh, change your mindset. The orientation has to change. The traditional model, the perimeter-based model is no longer valid, will not hold true. And you have to move away from it as soon as you possibly can. If you don't have resources, do what you can do without resources. You can change policies, you can have dialogue, you can communicate the value of using this new model. Do not wait for the money and people to show up on your door and ask you for that. So please act on it urgently. This is not something you can avoid and, and sort of say, well, I'll take care of it later on. There is no later on, quite frankly, at this one. All right, excellent. And Josh, lucky you, you get the final thought here on this. Uh, any closing thoughts you'd like to leave with the audience? Yeah, so you know, just to kind of build on that last conversation, um, for those in the audience that are unsure where to go, what that next little step is, um, I have built a team of engineers that are very passionate about working with the federal government and we care about helping you support your mission. So we want to have those educational conversations um, with you and what that looks like uh, to help you do the right thing to support your agency and mission. So if you have questions, we'd love to talk to you. All right. Well, uh, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Uh, please give everyone a virtual round of applause here. And uh, with that, Tom, back over to you. Great. Thank you, Jory. And you're still down in New Orleans, right? No, no, that's uh, my coworker, Jared. I'm uh, I'm down in uh, the Chinatown Bureau for, uh, for today yes. here in D.C. proper. Right. Good stuff. Thank you, Jory, so much for that. Thank you for the rest of the panelists. Um, we're moving ever onward and forward, we next have with us uh, Frank, and I hope I get this right, I'm not, uh, Briguglio? Briguglio, yes, sir. Briguglio, yes. And where are you out of, Frank? Uh, Annapolis, Maryland. Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, that is actually, I will take the liberty, I'll pull a Jason Miller. I'll, I'll take the liberty of saying that's where our Guy Tech Summit is going to be, our next in-person event. Uh, Lord willing, uh, on May 1st. I think uh, hopefully this uh, will finally get post-pandemic at some point here, but we're, we've got, uh, we're staying at the Graduate Hotel, which has been redesigned a couple years ago. Uh, fantastic. Uh, and uh, Frank, you're, Frank is the global public sector strategist over at SailPoint. And I think you, uh, Beyond Trust mentioned your company name like 55 times. So, you know, they, they, you might owe them a beer or something. Possibly, yeah. We, we tend to do that with each other. Um, we definitely have a better together story. Great. Well, I'm looking forward to your presentation. Thank you. Outstanding. Um, I'm going to go ahead and, and kick off my share, everyone. Give me one second. Um, I believe you should be able to see me now, I hope. Um, you know, first off, I, I would like to thank Tom and the ATART crew uh, for hosting this great event. You know, it's always a pleasure to work with our industry partners at Beyond Trust. Both Josh and, and Maury have done, and I have done several presentations together. You know, we have a great group of moderators and panelists here. And of course, all of you for taking the time today to join this session. Um, I'm going to talk to this a little bit differently. I'm not going to tell you a lot about SailPoint um, or where we're at. Uh, just real briefly, we're deployed at about 65 federal civilian agencies. Um, SailPoint is the master user record, so your agency probably has an instance of SailPoint running. And many agencies are using it at a very degree of, of complexity. So um, I'm going to talk about some things in RBAC and ABAC and access modeling that you may not be using, but definitely reach out to us. So without uh, any further ado, I'm going to go ahead and get started and just really set the stage um, 
you know, the impact of cybersecurity breaches to me is staggering, you know, and it doesn't matter which geo you are in or, or vertical you're in, you know, no one is immune. I work with governments across the globe as the global public sector strategist, and I hear the same stories, the same concerns. Um, and, and this is just a, a clear indication that traditional security isn't uh, solving this, this increasing cybersecurity risk problem. Um, it's been mentioned today that, that there is no silver bullet for zero trust. I heard Sanjay, I heard Josh, Maury all mention, you know, this is a concept. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a mind shift in how we think about security. Um, most importantly, it, it's a team sport. Um, and I mention this in probably every presentation I do. And the fact that, you know, SailPoint is here with our partner Beyond Trust. Um, there's a lot of different domains that make up this term we call identity. Um, and that's one of the things we're going to talk about a little bit today. Um, it sounds like based on the polls that I saw, there's varying levels um, of, you know, activity going on within the agencies. I see that myself. Um, I hear a lot, where do we start? And I'd say, you know, I'm going to give, give Ken and his team a little, a little props. Um, I'm going to say we already started, and that foundation began with FICAM several years ago. Um, I'm an old gray identity guy, started in the DOD PKI program and, and as a PKI architect, worked on the federal civilian PKI architecture, um, was at Deloitte and, and participated in writing the, the FICAM roadmap. Um, I'm part of the NCCOE Zero Trust uh, Implementation Project, the CRADA Initiative. So all of these things, you know, have shown me, and, and, and what I take away from this is they're all critically important and they belong together. Uh, even though CDM wasn't a, a initiative to support ICAM or even Zero Trust, um, it's foundational. And, and let's unpack FICAM a little bit. You know, it goes beyond the authenticator. Uh, I hear a lot talked about the CAC card or the PIV card or Active Directory or authentication. That's only one small piece of the domains that make up uh, ICAM. ICAM is defined as, you know, the tools, policies, and systems that enable the right individual to access the right resources at the right time for the right reason. There is a lot in there when it says that, that requires lifecycle automation, it requires roles, it requires policies, it requires entitlement management, it requires attestations and access certifications. So that identity management piece that makes up that first I, there's a lot in there. It's how the agency collects and verifies and manages the attributes. You know, there's so much in there and all of that is required by NIST and FISMA. We have to have separation of duties. You know, there's so many different things that we can unpack there. We don't have the time today. You know, credential management is more about how we're managing the credential, but how are we governing the credential as we move towards these derived or other types of credentials? Tie that to your ICAM system. That's how we began all of this, governing the credential issuance with ICAM. And now that we have that data in the master user record, it's very easy to create that linkage between ICAM, CDM, Zero Trust, and the new credentials that are required. And access management, you know, we can't say enough. And, and really, you know, in access management, that pillar is so critical, whether we're talking about privileged users, we're talking about web-based single sign-on, um, whether we're talking about RBAC or ABAC, you know, that's an argument that we can have forever, whether roles are dead or still alive. Um, but all of these things are, are very important in this next step that agencies need to take. And, you know, I'm going to be a little self-serving and say sale point identity security and identity security is a trademark term we've been using for quite some time. It is identity management. It is identity governance. That's We've been the leader for six plus years straight, not just a leader, the leader um, in front of all the other providers in this, in this space. We are the master user record uh, for the DHS CDM program. So we're sitting there running in your network with this data. We prov already providing just with that data, the visibility and, and compliance 
for all privileged access. Now let's take that the next step further and let's modernize and mature those implementations um, to include the control. And that's what we're gonna talk about here in these next couple um, discussions. So like I said, it, it wasn't an original use. The master user record, um, it's a critical component of ICAM and Zero Trust. It provides the decision makers, approvers, and security analysts visibility into who's on the network, the access that they have and their suitability to maintain those accounts. Um, you know, we hear a lot of times, you know, that zero trust is about data protection and, and attribute-based authentication. Um, absolutely. And that's what makes this, this contextual data that we have from the identity ecosystem critical in zero trust. It's crucial to zero trust because the model relies on us to be able to track user identities across the enterprise, not just for a specific system. We need to look at the risk a user poses to the environment by seeing all their access. And that really is um, via that visibility, right? Um, I mentioned before, it's been mentioned a bunch. Zero Trust is not, you know, one technology. Uh, and in, in order to fully embrace it, we need to embrace um, the model that we're using for identity and security and how we're protecting not only our people, but our assets and our sensitive data. Um, so in short, you know, what we're doing is we're moving from implicit trust, where as Josh said, and I love Josh's analogy, where he said, you know, we built a zoo, but didn't build any, any pens inside that zoo. That's exactly what we've seen. I could, Josh, that was awesome. Um, you know, without the automation, without the control, without simple use cases like joiner, mover, lever, we can't remove the access or grant the access or modify that access when something changes about a user. And it might be something that changes about me, whether it's my job title, it might be a department, might be a program I work on, might be something that is my cybersecurity awareness training, maybe my, my clearance status or my background investigation status. It might be my credential status. All of these things make up those rules, not just time of day when someone logs in or where they're logging in from, right? And, you know, with, with the recent executive order and all of the efforts from GSA and CISA on this topic of zero trust, you know, I think it's welcome to, across the government um, to now have this, um, you, you know, movement um, to protect, you know, the threats against our society, our individuals, you know, and our sensitive access with the, in government, you know, but embracing zero trust you know, as I said, identity has to be the new perimeter. Um, and I think we all agree on this, but we don't necessarily have to replace existing technologies. Like I said, um, with the CDM um, programs, many of the agencies already have, you know, a solution like SailPoint or, or parts of the SailPoint solution. They may already have Beyond Trust, part of the Beyond Trust solution. They may be loosely coupled at this time. It's time for now the agencies to mature those um, and embrace this new as identity as the new security perimeter so we can get to that uh, least privileged access. And that's exactly what, what SailPoint provides for Beyond Trust. Um, you know, there's a saying that we have in, in identity governance is you can't govern what you can't see. And, you know, I think the EO states, you know, user access should be based on allowing full access, but only to the bare minimum users need to perform their jobs. Um, by pivoting to the least privileged model with continuous monitoring and ongoing governance, you know, those are the critical components of risk reduction, right? Where we're using attribute-based data to then move through um, our, you know, um, reduction initiatives and enforce the policies on the at the identity layer uh, before they're even provisioned maybe into an account um, so they can log into it. So at SailPoint, you know, we facilitate the identity to support and strengthen zero trust principles. We leverage a continuous policy and risk assessment every time an assignment is made, anytime an account is created, a privilege is requested or granted. 
a new employee contractor is onboarded or, or moves internally, and we're using that contextual data, trust, cred, priv, behave, in those decisions. Um, those are very easy data elements to use in this decision-making process. You know, so we can enforce that least privilege. Uh, we can look at SOD controls um, across all applications, not just privileged users. We're looking at this for all access. You know, and also in the, in the recent guidance, you know, the administration outlines its position where, you know, in practice, the agency needs to implement, you know, um, implicit trust, right? That's an, e you know, I won't say an easy one, but, you know, that's the first one. The just enough access capabilities and bare minimum and granular risk, out, granular and risk-based controls, that's where the identity and privilege management tools really are going to um, assist the agencies in achieving some of those zero trust objectives that they desire. Um, zero trust also calls for attribute-based access control, where identities and, and role models, attributes must be governed. Um, when it comes to access control, role-based access control is probably the easiest. ABAC is probably the, uh, the hardest. Um, so how do you know which one is right for you? And as, as you go down and start to evaluate these at your agency, you know, Think of it as RBAC is a higher level extraction where ABAC can be more fine grained. One of the one of the my biggest um, concerns and recommendations is when we get into that ABAC model, you still have to govern the attributes used in those policies and we still have to govern those policies. Typically, those policies aren't human readable. So how do we identify that? Right. Um, in some combinations, you know, it's a concept of both roles and attributes based off um, access um, to build these, you know, to build that heavy protection um, that, that we need and desire in zero trust. But, you know, we, we, someone said you don't need tools to do access certifications. Absolutely, you do. It is so time consuming and, and prone to human um, human nature, um, but human, our own vulnerabilities of skipping a line in one of those spreadsheets or clicking too many times in one of those spreadsheets. Um, by having all of this access in front of you, it makes things easier. And at SailPoint, what we've done, we've, we've embraced artificial intelligence and machine learning in our platform, and we've developed some access modeling capabilities. And you, hear, you see this you know, slide going off and it's just showing you how we're, you know, using data um, and artificial intelligence to build proper roles um, and to build that protection. So whether you're new to identity or your agency, you know, is looking to get to the next level, um, you know, I think we need to have a conversation about access modeling and role-based and attribute-based access control. Um, how can you build those access models faster and easier? How can you continuously evaluate um, and maintain those access models? And you know, most importantly, it's optimizing that access governance across all of your applications within your ecosystem. So with that, I want to thank you again for attending. And if you have any questions about how SailPoint Beyond Trust uh, work together or FICAM or CDM, the master user record, uh, can aid your agency on your zero trust journey, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, stay tuned to hear more about the NCCOE zero trust implementation project. SailPoint's very proud to be part of that initiative and we're doing some great things, proving out some of these zero trust cases, use cases with our, with our partners. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back to Tom. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Frank. And it's okay if we distribute this presentation after the event. I did include a a PDF um, of of a of an ebook to send out that's you know basically has all that text in it that um, the slide deck didn't. No problem. Why? Well, I, I, cool. I appreciate it. Okay, yeah, we're absolutely. moving on to the panel of the day. I think it's still morning. We're running a little bit late, but not too bad. And uh, I think you're going to really uh, have a good time with this. 
we have uh, Dave Nazareth here with FedScoop. How are you doing there, Dave? Doing great. How are you? Good. Are you in the office? Down no, down? I'm in my kitchen. <laughs> okay. Uh, oh, we were back in the office for a little while, but uh, Omicron has us uh, hiding at home for, for a little bit. Great, great. Well, good to see you. I'm looking forward to your panel. Yeah, definitely looking forward to the discussion. Thanks for having me. Uh, before we begin, I just want to encourage everyone in the audience to submit questions on your own during the Q&A section of the platform. We'll be going through them, uh, so send them in as we go. Please also remember to answer the poll questions as we go through them to ensure you get your CPE credits. I'd like to introduce our panelists. First off, uh, we have Carol House, Director for Cybersecurity and Secure Digital Innovation for the White House National Security Council, Grant Dasher with the Office of Technical Director for Cyber at the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, Jeffrey Schilling, Chief Information Officer acting at the Center for Biomedical Informatics and Information Technology within the National Institutes of Health, and then Frank Regugulo, <laughs> I butcher that, I'm sorry, I, but we just heard from him, the Global pu Public Sector Strategist at SailPoint. <laughs> um, uh, thanks for being here with us today. And I actually wanted to start off by uh, introducing the first poll question, see how many people are paying attention this morning. Um, in your opinion, what is the importance behind using zero trust to help agencies achieve ICAM cybersecurity goals? Very important, important, not important, or I don't know. All right, let's see the results on that. So far and away, people see it as very important. 81% uh, of you, uh, followed by 12%, very important. Uh, this is very positive. I'm seeing the, uh, the uh, panelists clap to this, uh, which leads me to my first question for the panel, uh, which is just uh, echoing this. Does this kind of mirror what you're seeing? How are agencies using a zero trust mindset to improve ICAM? Uh, and anyone can jump in. Yeah, I, I will. I'll take that first whack at that. Absolutely, we're seeing an uptick. I mean, over the past two years, um, I would say not only driven by digital transformation um, and modernization, but you know, the pandemic it made everyone realize the identity was far more important than they've been taking it. Um, as they started to rapidly issue new types of credentials or new access a result of re re remote working, it absolutely became more critical. And now with the push towards zero trust, we're seeing that uptick, um, like I said, in operationalizing their CDM system um, into th that access uh, governance kind of model. Yeah, Carol, Jeffrey, oh, Grant. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, yeah, I would agree. I mean, I think, you know, we're seeing a lot of interest. Um, I mean, some of it is, you know, because because our folks up at the White House are pushing really hard for people to care about it. But certainly, um, you know, we see a lot of agencies who are are trying to to really finally, you know, um, put their CDM house in order in the identity space and really sort of lean into it. So yeah, it's an exciting time for sure. Great. I'll tee off that. Uh, so thanks for, for, for the comments on the White House pushing. Uh, it's definitely a priority for us. Um, and we we see that identity really sits at the heart of, of zero trust. Um, the it, With the announcement of the strategy, the finalization of it, based on um, really great feedback from the public. So thanks to anybody who offered, uh, who offered comments during the public notice and comment period. Um, the White House has really been clearly driving home the message that they should not automatically trust uh, anything inside or outside their perimeters. They must verify anything and everything trying to connect to their systems before granting access. So just there, the, the, the requirement to identify and then manage access to their networks, ICAM obviously sits at the heart of it. So uh, of, of any effective zero trust implementation. So um, we're definitely driving it a lot, seeing a lot of focus on it, um, having a lot of partnership from great agencies like CISA, um, who, who've been publishing some great um, some, some great materials that will that will help agencies with both cloud and zero trust implementation. So um, yeah, I think we're definitely seeing agencies um, take that that mandate seriously. And I think you you certainly won't see less emphasis coming from the White House on the priority there. I'm hey I'm uh, I'm just happy to have a panelist that speaks faster than I do. Thank you, Carol. So uh, um, you know I would say you know if if you look uh, from me, I'm more of a like a consumer. So so um, I was going to try to today to give that consumer perspective because 
Um, while we're a customer of, you know, we have SailPoint at NIH. Um, when I was introduced, you know, when Dave introduced me, I'm not what he said I was, right? I'm the CIO of the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the NIH, which is part of HHS. And I think it goes back to what Frank was saying, Frank, Frank was saying is all this stuff is confusing. And, 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 and it's kind of like these titles and roles that we use as humans mm, don't really work great for the computers. Oh, I'm also this and I'm, and I'm the director too, but that's acting and I'm also do this and I approve these things and that gives me access to the financial system. It's like, wait a second, you know, how, how does this work exactly? So one of the things I really wanna get across is it's super confusing to everybody. The, who chose the name Zero Trust? That was dumb. It's a hundred percent. No, it's like, it's like, I just think that's a goofy name because it, it gets the wrong thing. It's a jargony thing, right? To me, we, you could call it maybe digital trust or to me just saying, it's just modernizing it. It's everything we do is so insecure by design. It's open by design. And uh, I think at some point, I know that's not for today. I'd love to talk about a new design. We keep shoring up this old design where anybody could just get on the internet and just crash into you. Like imagine if you were to just to go and drive in your car and crash into someone and say, oh, I see you later. Like you can't do that. You have to get a driver's license. You have to be identified by your driver's license. You, 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 you'll get arrested if you drive without that license. The internet is no such thing like that. So somehow we've adopted this. Like we, we've gone into this super unsafe area and now we're spending millions and millions and millions to secure it. And it's very complicated. And in a way, we're not even looking to say, you know, we don't have to live in this space. We could create a whole new model at some at some point, especially the government could. So I'd love to. I love. I know as I'm more interested in the identity and the um, the I, IAL two. You know, the identity. Um, oh, I knew I was going to forget the word uh, proofing. The identity proofing. I'm very interested in that because I think as a nation we need to address that. And I, I have these big hit hitters here from the White House. So I'd love to hear what they have to say about that. So. So, so yeah, very excited about this, uh, about this topic and this, and this uh, panel. Well, Jeff, I just want to apologize about the title mix up and also say that I appreciate the real talk around zero trust and our terminology here. Um, I, I do want to say, uh, uh, move on to the next question, just being uh, identity governance, which you mentioned, uh, what tools are your agencies prioritizing to ensure that, that that's in place? So I can go first on this one. Um, so, uh, and I'll speak to, you know, what, what CISA is pushing as part of CDM um, as, as rather than what we we're internally adopting because we're just a consumer of that. Um, so, you know, as Frank was saying earlier, I mean, the central concept is the master user record and, you know, most agencies do use his company's tool to implement the master user record. It's a very powerful tool. Um, but I think the important part, well, an important part is not just the tool, Right, it's the integration and the ecosystem. So you have to link together your HSPD 12 infrastructure and your master user record and your, you know, training infrastructure and your background investigations and all of and your Active Directory and your other sort of, you know, identity silos that exist throughout your organization. You know, in the ideal implementation, you tie all of this stuff together into a single record so that you can actually track the life cycle of someone as they move through the agency. And so it's not just like, as in all things identity, it's not just you buy a single tool and your problems are done. It's a tool helps you get leverage to solve a very complicated problem. And then you sort of have to put in the work and the understanding of your organization to sort of tie everything together so you can actually achieve um, you know, that mechanism. And if you do it well, it can be extremely powerful from a security point of view. Um, and if you don't, you end up, you know, with a lot of manual processes and a lot of strangling accounts, which I guarantee you someone will compromise at some point and you will have all sorts of problems. So, you know, that's, that's sort of how we think about it. The CDM program, as was mentioned, has been investing in this for the better part of a decade. Um, we're still not done, unfortunately, and probably never will be, um, but it's really critical. And I think the whole push towards identity centric security just makes it even, even more critical. Um, you know, most of my background, I have, you know, that sort of bounce between the government and the private sector over the years. More, uh, but even, you know, in the private sector, worked for a major Fortune 500 company. We struggled with this, right? This is not easy. 
Um, but it is really, really important. And yeah, so tools like SailPoint give a great amount of leverage over the problem. So. Curious to hear the other panelists' thoughts on uh, Grant's thoughts. Well, I definitely appreciate um, Grant pointing to the importance of consolidating identity systems and managing enterprise wide accounts. Of course, that's consistent with um, with the direction from up here. So I know from, from my agency, I don't manage EOP's network. So the tools that we use are the executive order uh, that I know Frank spoke to earlier on improving um, the nation's cybersecurity to, to direct implementation of things like MFA and, of course, development of, um, of the zero trust strategy and implementation of that across agencies. So um, just from my policy, side, that's the way that we've established that it's a priority. And then, of course, working with offices like um, the Office of Management and Budget to, to create the strategy, oversee implementation, um, and try to make sure that resources um, and budgets are aligned with those priorities. Um, that's um, a, a key tool that certainly the in partnership that we've been leveraging from this seat. So, so before Frank goes, because he'll he'll have a great answer. I will say again, say from more the consumer perspective, I would I would say we, you know, we we use tools, we use SailPoint, we use uh, Azure AD. You know, we I never heard of this master user record. That sounds pretty sweet. We've been we've been doing something we call kind of Staff 360, but but since that's a formal name, I'll go over about that. Uh, I I don't think. Um, we don't have yet a vision. I proposed this vision maybe almost a decade ago. Uh, time goes by so fast, it's hard to believe it. It sounds like it was a year ago, but I think it was almost 10 years ago. I said, you know, we have a very like organizational model. If I want to, if I want to get something from this group, I go to their website. Um, it, it's as internal of an NIH. And so they, they generally, we have a central identity, right? But we don't have the idea that as a person, I should be getting the things I need, right? So so we're, today we're talking about cybersecurity and identity, but it could also be, I'm a doctor working at the clinical center, thus I have to have this training and this training and this training. And of course we put that in sale point. So if they don't get that training, they'll lose their credential, right? They won't be able to log in, da, da, da. But we could also say, but I should also be notified of this, right? So you could take it from just from being like, okay, I'm in to, uh, to saying, well, no, I'm, I'm actually how I'm managed is because of my identity. So I think that would be good. I wanted to add one more thing quickly, and I think that's around COTS products. What holds us back at NIH is COTS products. So when the COTS products comes in, we have to then kind of either it fits, like it can have a SAML integration or something like that, or, or it, it, but it doesn't maybe um, like that, that thing Frank said, that he quoted someone about the zoo. It's more like its own zoo. So inside the zoo, what logging is it doing? Is it using service accounts, which we don't want it to do, right? We want it to actually say this person did this. So it would be nice, uh, it would be nice, uh, Carol, if we could somehow say there is a federal certification for your COTS product is certified for zero trust. Therefore, that when you implement it, it's, it it'll, it'll implement according to the federal standard. Otherwise, I have to buy it or put something in a contract or the vendors don't know what to do. Once you make that certification like FedRAMP, the vendors at least have like a goal and they can say, I've heard of this. Oh my God, it costs that much money to get FedRAM certified. I'm like, well, we better get our act together. We better figure something out. But this idea that if we don't give the vendors clarity on what we want, how we want their applications to work, not just together, but even internally, because obviously the, 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 the world is going to these platforms. How do these platforms do it? I think that would be a very, a very powerful thing to not just think about the, you know, the, oh, I logged in. You know, okay, what about, what about after that? Jeff, sorry. So, I, um, so sorry, I didn't realize that <laughs> I didn't want to like hog the conversation on that point, but I really do appreciate you raising the issue about like how to try to validate or ensure that, that your, that your commercial solutions are meeting what what you're trying to implement consistent with whatever you're trying to do under zero trust and i guess understanding that there's not just one solution that you're going to be able to purchase that's going to like you know like off the shelf sort of implement zero trust and it really is it is an evolution and a maturity cons consistent with the maturity model um i know that sisa put out um 
I, I am curious, certainly, for thoughts from the others about sort of how practically you put that into into effect um, for validation. I guess maybe how multi you would have to account for a lot of different uh, a lot of different providers, and then the, the unique specific you know architecture um, and implementation for every single agency. Um, but I mean, it, it's an interesting issue. Would love to know um, from maybe an industry provider, Frank, if you have any thoughts on what validation for your service against zero trust would would look like. Yeah, that, there's a lot to unpack there, Carol. Thanks for, for loading me with that cannonball. <laughs> um, but, you know, Jeff has a really good point. But, you know, let's take a step back and think of a back and R back, right? It's an age old argument that roles are dead. We're moving towards attribute based access, right? But let's look at those COTS products. Most COTS products don't support an A back model. So you have to extrapolate it to, um, an access management layer. Well, that then gets us in a little bit of trouble because then how are we enforcing that? So when we look at, you know, provisioning or or, or granting access via attribute um, or at, at runtime or, or anything, we need to ensure not only the attributes are correct, um, but also the application supports it. And this has been something that's, you know, been going on like at SailPoint, we don't have that problem. We operate on a capabilities model where, you know, there isn't a service account per se, um, unless the end target requires it. Um, but I log in and it knows that Frank is a help desk administrator or Frank is an auditor or Frank is a, and those are all attributes that drive access within the system itself. And I think as we get you know, down the zero trust model, I, I think Jeff's absolutely right. I mean, applications are gonna have to support um, ABAC better than they do today. Yeah, I just make one. Oh, no, oh, sorry. No, I was just gonna say, I just make one note on this. Um, so, you know, one of the things that is in the OMB, in the OMB memo um, that actually we at CISA worked on the language around this topic at some length, because it's a really important point, um, you know, and again, I, I, previously I worked at Google, right? And so we've been doing um, Beyond Corp sort of since the beginning of this. And one of the things that we found there, which I think is reflected in the memo, is you need sort of defensible places to enforce the policy, right? So if you just have every application doing the authorization in the application code itself, you're sort of at the whim of a bug in the application. You find an auth bypass and you're done, right? So you need defensible ways of enforcing policy to which Frank was sort of alluding to. And so one of the things that you know we sort of call for in there is balancing between attributes and roles, right? So you have an application that uses roles, it's used roles forever, they're specific to how you're accessing particular populations of data, that's fine. Um, you can connect that with a defensible policy enforcement point, a gateway of some kind, there are many different strategies. Um, where you can implement attributes, where you can implement the control mechanisms. And I think that, you know, it, it's a very sort of nuanced topic, but I think that there are sort of evolving strategies in the market. Um, the, the whole market is a bit of a land grab right now, which I think makes it difficult for agencies because everyone is sort of trying to stake out their position. My expectation is that over time, we'll see some consolidation, we'll see some standards get developed for better interoperability between these products. And it'll sort of become clear, like how how this will all fit together. Unfortunately, we don't have time to wait for that. Like we need to really get out there and start executing this, and and you know taking steps in this direction. Um, but but yeah, so that's just the, the the little bit of nuance I wanted to add on this discussion. Since the memo was brought up, I I do want to go to our next poll question. How familiar are you with the new OMB Zero Trust Memo? Very familiar, familiar, slightly familiar. I have not read it. All right, let's see the results on that. All right, so most people are familiar, 55%. Some 10% are very familiar or slightly familiar. And then we've got about a quarter, well, exactly a quarter, who have not read it. Uh, so that brings me to my next question, which is, what are your thoughts on the memo? Um, does it move uh, adv or advance ICAM the way you'd like to see it advanced? 
I'll kick off um, since, uh, of course, another component of, of the executive office of the president. So very supportive of OMB's memo, um, just a wonderful step forward. Um, again, very well informed by comments that came from the public. So thanks to everybody. But um, for us, I'm really excited about the fact that identity remains the first pillar of the strategy. And we talked about it before, how identity just sits at, at the heart of an effective zero trust implementation. So um, for internal multi-factor, um, we set a clear bar of requiring phishing resistant multi-factor authentication for internal facing government systems. This is what we believe must be the baseline for for the US government. So very excited um, about that focus. And uh, on public multi-factor, we're also requiring that, um, that phishing resistant MFA be an option when multi-factor authentication um, is used in a public facing system. So this just continues to add options for the public and doesn't take anything away. Um, they need options to enable equitable access. And this promotes interoperability between internal and external use cases, um, which can be very important to, um, across a couple of different use cases like potentially health perspective. Um, so I'm really excited about some of those provisions and then also the focus on passwordlessness um, and pointing to like FIDO2 and WebAuth and standards that support a passwordless approach um, and excited to see how government services could take advantage of this where like PIV cards um, are not always um, are, are not always usable. Um, finally, on, on password use, uh, we also require agencies to eliminate some outdated uh, password practices like periodic rotation and use of special characters. So for me, a lot of those provisions on the, on the authentication front are things that I'm very excited about uh, being focused on in the memo. But um, I'll turn it over to any of the other speakers on the agency or industry side about how you guys feel. Jeff or Grant? Yeah, I'll, I'll go ahead. I, I think... Um, uh, you know, the, the one thing that we struggle with mostly is um, the difficulty with PIV. That's number one. If, if, if a system or the user's PIV card fails, we only, the only way they can get that PIV card replaced is to come to Bethesda and get that PIV card replaced. And we have all this remote workers and we have no travel allowed. So like, what are we supposed to do here? And so we relied to me too much on one vector saying this PIV is so great. It's like, it's not so great because it doesn't work hundred percent. I need some redundancy in how I'm going to identify the person. The second thing I would say we struggle with is at, at the National Institutes of Health, as you can imagine now, nobody probably really heard of it very much until now. It's like, oh my gosh, this is awesome, right? It's so great. We have this so great. They're working on all this stuff but we collaborate mostly. We collaborate, we, we give out most of our budget and grants, and then we give out um, extensive, amount, and we have collaborations with industry. Well, how do we identify those people? Carol, I'm putting this right on you. I need a formalized digital identity for the United States. If you're gonna say, you said it, you said it, Carol, I wish I, wish I would have recorded it. <laughs> identity is the most important thing. It's like, we, all we have is a driver's license, that's it. Maybe a passport, I, but I, but nothing's digital. I, you know, I live in Maryland because that's where NIH is. And then I was so excited. I got this email like a year ago. It said, Maryland goes to a digital ID. I was like, awesome. I clicked the link and you know what it was? It was a picture of your driver's license for the police officer. I'm like, that's not a digital ID. I mean, I, I guess it is maybe, but it wasn't a digital ID. And so that means the people who sent that email they don't even know what a digital ID is and the complexity of it, right? In America, we, we have very differences of opinion and trust in the government and then what it means to not have one. Like we don't have one. And, and, and you know, it's, it's, it makes all life difficult today for, for, for all of us. Anyway, so that's what I was just thinking. Yeah, since you brought that up, I'll, I'll just very quickly mention that um, I hear you. I hear you, Jeffrey. Um, and um, I know that identity can mean a lot of different things, as does digital identity. Um, but know that the administration is looking very hard at what at what we need to do on identity. Obviously, identity has been a critical part of the cyber EO, of the zero trust strategy, tons of other priorities for us, um, like the beneficial ownership database that's being stood up at FinCEN, counter corruption efforts, countering fraud um, that, that we've 
we've seen in the pandemic and otherwise. Um, so all of this is a huge priority and we are considering what the administration's approach will be towards things like digital credential issuance, attribute validation services, et cetera. Um, so I know that's not the focus of this topic. So I'll just highlight that the administration cares and we are looking to determine what our approach will be towards those things. Yeah, I, I'll just come back to the memo quickly and say, I mean, obviously, CISA is a is a big fan of the memo. We worked closely with with OMB uh, to help draft it. Um, and I think, you know, it's really exciting for me personally to see, um, you know, the just the shift in intensity and point of view uh, since, you know, 2015, when we were talking OPM and we were just talking about, you know, how are we going to act? We started to think about identity at some level in the enterprise. I mean, we could think about it for a long time with PIV, but really in the civilian sector started to say, okay, we need to actually adopt these technologies in our logical systems access. And just to see how far we've come in the last seven years is, is really great. And so, yeah. Frank, did you have any thoughts on the memo? Uh, I, I would say my biggest thoughts on, on the memo is is just it, it has has really brought forth um, an initiative that agencies are doing things. Um, you, you know, I'm not going to pick on any one area. I think they're all important, but really, it is just as I mentioned in my tech talk. Um, it, it really is that that push forward. Uh, I think that a lot of agencies needed to take this this modernizing their security infrastructure. Um, you, you know, I think someone said it earlier, if they're not told to do anything, they won't do it. Um, and this is a critical initiative that needs to be done. Now, we've already talked a, a lot about challenges. Uh, I, I had a question that was geared towards the COTS uh, issue in, in getting those to uh, to sort of fit federal requirements. But are there other challenges uh, in, in implementing identity-centric security that your agencies are, are experiencing or that you've seen, Frank, just in your work uh, that uh, you think are, are good to highlight and, and are maybe addressing? I think a, a big challenge is just going to be that it's it's going to take time um, and iteration, um, and that was openly acknowledged in the OMB memo. I, I really appreciated what what I felt was a very practical acknowledgement of the issues and the fact that everyone's still learning and that we're expecting agencies to continue to share best practices. So I, I think that some challenges to figure out like what what to focus on first um, and how to prioritize the, starting that shift um, and maturation over time, um, but also. I would I would note that based on those challenges, the administration has worked with with the agencies to try to focus on putting out resources that'll help them figure out what to prioritize. Um, and you see that in the OMB memo and the strategy that gives some very high impact areas to focus on. You see that in the reference architectures and maturity models and other resources that are all listed in the annex of the memo. So another thing to, to reason to look at the memo is that there's some great resources there. Um, but yeah, that, that's my take on on some of the challenges, but I'll turn it over to others. Yeah, I'll, I'll throw in there, you, you know, one of the things that, um, as, as I mentioned, you know, cybersecurity has become a team sport. And that's not just in the vendor community like us and our partners, um, but within the agency itself, you, you know, um, each organization, this has become a complex topic, just like identity has always been, because it touches so many organizations. It touches personnel management, touches security, touches IT, touches the business owners. Um, you know, zero trust, same thing. So we need to get better. And this is just my observation. You know, like I said, I was around back when we were doing the, the FICAM subcommittee days. There used to be FICAM offices within the agencies. Those have dwindled. Starting to see an uptick with them coming back. Um, starting to see zero trust organizations within the agencies, focus groups. Um, I, I just think that the biggest challenge is keeping people communicating and marching forward together to not paint themselves in many different corners that they could paint themselves into with, you know, spending budget on things they don't need yet, um, really taking a look at at where they're at um, with, you know, the different levels and layers of identity, zero trust, data protection, all these things are coordinated efforts. Um, and I would say that's my biggest takeaway as well, that, you know, hey, this is this is a group effort. Um, 
and it needs to be orchestrated. I, I wonder about some of the timelines that, that have been issued in some of the guidance. Um, they're pretty aggressive. <laughs> um, I like to see them, but they're pretty aggressive. Um, and, and just seeing how fast we're moving in some of the working groups that I'm involved in, it's like, wait a minute, how is this gonna work out? And that's why I'm saying there's agencies that may be popping ahead of the, you know, going to the, the you know, Cliff Notes version of Zero Trust and making procurements that just don't make sense. Um, or, you know, a shift in how they're doing things that don't make sense because it all hasn't been figured out for the government yet. Um, so those are just some of my observations and challenges. Well, I think we're just about at time here. Uh, Grant, uh, I saw you on mute. If you have a, a final thought, would love to hear it. Uh, but uh, yeah, sure, yeah. I would just I would just say I want to reiterate one point that's been made throughout the day a couple of times. You know, my biggest fear with this effort is that people will look for a silver bullet that they'll look to you know, buy a single product to buy zero trust into their, into their infrastructure because that's the easy thing. And frankly, there are you know, vendors out there who pitch their product as a silver bullet in some cases. Um, I think it is an architecture. Zero trust is a mindset and an architecture, and it is essentially building on these different long running security investments in the agencies and in any organization really. Um, and I think that's what uh, my real fear is, is to try and do everything we can as a government, as a vendor community to um, ensure that we are treating this as an architectural change, not as a point solution. Well, thank you all for your comments today. A great discussion. Thank you for self-moderating when I forgot to unmute there for a second. Uh, you know, it's a good talk when that happens. Uh, I'm going to flip it back over to Alyssa now, who's going to close us out. Great, thank you so much, Dave and panelists. That was such a great discussion full of so much insight. Um, unfortunately, that's all the time we have today, but I did wanna thank Beyond Trust and SailPoint for partnering with us on this um, amazing summit, as well as all of our amazing panelists and our keynote, um, Jerry Karen, for giving such great presentations today. I'd also like to thank you guys for joining us, um, and we do hope to see you at our next event. Before you go, we did talk about panel links a little earlier if you tuned in for panel one. Um, and we would love your feedback as ATAR does want to cater to what you all would like. Um, so if you could, could fill out this, pan, um, this poll question, just to give us an idea of the different types of panels everyone would like to see, that would be great. Um, and then after that, I do have one other poll question for everyone who would like a CPE credit. Um, so I will just close this one out. Um, just a quick share, because I know Jason Miller is on, or he was on. Um, so we are seeing it all across the board. So that's really helpful for ATARC. And then we'll just close out with the CPE question. Um, so if you did fill out all of the polls today, um, please let us know and we can go ahead and send you a CPE credit over email. Um, but that is everything we had for today. So thank you so much for joining us. And we do hope to see you February 3rd for our next webinar. Thank you and have a great day, everybody.